We've got quorum and we're ready to go in the chamber. Great, thanks so much, clerks. Okay, Council, I'm going to call this public hearing to order for uh, November 2nd. Uh, this meeting is being convened by electronic means. As such, Council members may participate in person or by electronic means. Uh, for Council members participating in ele by electronic means, per the recently amended procedure bylaw, please ensure your video is turned on and let the clerk know if you leave the meeting for the purposes of confirming quorum. If council members attending by electronic means lose connection during any portion of the hearing, we will recess the meeting until the connection is restored. If council members lose connection during the voting process, staff will get you back online quickly when, when we suspend the vote while we suspend the voting process. Contact information, uh, you should have that. Members of the public can view the proceedings via the live stream and YouTube link, which will be tweeted out on uh, Twitter at Van City Clerk. This is the handle at Van City Clerk. Of course, as always, we acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional uh, territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh people and thank them for having cared for these, these lands uh, as we work in partnership together to build this great city. And as always, uh, thanks to staff for everything you do for us. Uh, Clerk, can we have the uh, roll call, please? Uh, Mayor Stewart in the chair. Councillor Carr. Here. Councillor DiGenova. Uh, absent, Councillor uh, Councillor Fry. No. Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick. Present. Councillor Weeb. Present. Councillor Boyle. Present. Councillor Dominato. Present. Councillor Bly. Present. Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Kirby Young. I can see Councillor Kirby Young uh, on the WebEx. I guess that her sound is off. Uh, you have quorum, Mayor Stewart. Thank you so much for that. Um, great. So before I begin, I had some announcements. Uh, the public may participate uh, in this meeting by speaking in person, by phone, or by submitting written comments to Mayor and Council. Speakers have five minutes to make their comments and should limit their comments to the merits of the report being considered. Speakers should also indicate whether they are in support or oppose the recommendations and whether or not they're a resident of Vancouver. Speakers may only speak once and should follow along on Twitter at Van City Clerk for updates on the progress of the meeting so you don't miss your turn to speak. Any comments on agenda items can be submitted in writing through our online web form at Vancouver Public Hearings, uh, so vancouver.ca forward slash public dash hearing dash comments. The link will also be tweeted. Those speaking on behalf of other persons or groups will have eight minutes to speak only if those represented are also present on the phone or in person and must not be speakers themselves. Speakers who pre-registered with presentations are reminded that the public live feed has a slight delay and so we'll help you through that uh, when you're presenting. Uh, we also have a very long-standing commitment to equity, diversity and inclusion and so reminding council that when addressing uh, speakers and staff we'll avoid using gendered honorifics and instead refer to uh, the person by first and last name, role or title. A reminder that council's role at a public hearing is to be a quasi-judicial quasi body, which means council is only to consider the merits of the rezoning application or heritage designation, uh, not discussions of uh, broader policy discussions. Uh, council members may ask clarifying questions from speakers, including the applicant or technical advice from staff, but should save debate for after the close of the speakers list. After we hear from speakers, council can approve the application in principle, refuse the application and refer the application to staff for further consideration. Finally, if council does not conclude from hearing from all speakers this evening, we will recess and reconvene the meeting on Thursday, November 4th at 6 p.m. So we really have just uh, one item on this, uh, on this agenda and it is item one, streamlining rental around local shopping areas, amendment to the C2, C2B, C2C and C to C1 zones and creation of new rental zones for use in future rezoning applications in surrounding low density areas under the secured rental policy. Just asking, uh, it, does any member of council wish to declare a conflict of interest on this item? Uh, just a verbal indication is fine. 
Okay, thanks so much. So we'll proceed. I get the clerks to read the application and summary of correspondence received. This is an application by the General Manager of Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability for Council's consideration. Amendments to the Zoning and Development Bylaw for C-2, C-2B, C-2C, C -2C, C and C-2C1 district schedules to allow new secured rental buildings up to six stories outside of areas subject to recent and ongoing community planning programs and other minor changes to the C-2 zones that will apply citywide. Amendments to the Zoning and Development Bylaw to introduce three new standard rental district schedules. RR-1, RR-2A, RR-2B, RR-2C, RR-3A, and RR-3B to enable the consideration of future rezoning applications under the secured rental policy. No properties are proposed to be rezoned to a new rental RR district schedule at this time. Each future rezoning application considered under the secured rental policy would require a decision by City Council following a separate public hearing. Amendments to C-2 design guidelines new design guidelines for secured rental projects in C-2 and RR zones and consequential amendments to the sign bylaw, noise control bylaw, parking bylaw, and subdivision bylaw, and amendments to the secured rental policy 2019 to reflect the proposed zoning cha changes and updates the locational criteria that will be used to determine eligibility for future rental rezoning applications. The general manager of planning Urban Design and Sustainability recommends approval subject to conditions set out in the summary and recommendation of the public hearing agenda. The following correspondence has been received since the referral of public to public hearing and prior to the close of the speaker's list and receipt of public comments. 248 pieces of correspondence in support, 244 pieces of correspondence in opposition, and nine pieces of correspondence dealing with other aspects of the application. This represents all correspondence received up to 4 p.m. today. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, any speakers for this item and wish to speak, please call toll free 1 833 353 8610, code 53777 pound before the close of the speakers list. Uh, this number is on Twitter and made available on the live stream. There will be an opportunity for those on the phone or in person to speak at the end of the registered speakers list. Uh, we have Edna Cho, Senior Planner uh, for Housing Policy, Planning, and Urban Design and Sustainability, here to present the application. and. Um, Council, it's just under 40 slides, so we'll take a, a little bit of time. But afterwards, um, uh, of course, you're allowed to ask questions. Uh, and so we'll proceed on to the presentation. Hey, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Edna Cho, Senior Planner in Housing Policy in Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability. Tonight's council report is an application from the General Manager of Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability and includes three main changes. One, to amend the C2, C2B, C2C and C2C1 zones to allow six-story rental. Six-story rental is already allowed in commercial areas currently through rezonings. The change proposed is to put six-story developments into the existing zoning so a rezoning will no longer be required. The second change is to add three new rental uh, standard rental district schedules for use with rezonings in low density RS and RT areas under the secure rental policy. The intent of this change is to streamline the process. It's still a rezoning, but with clearer rules and shorter process. And third, as a result of the zoning changes proposed, staff are recommending consequential amendments to the secure rental policy to update the location criteria in low density areas. This initiative came from the secure rental policy approved by this council in November 2019. As part of the implementation, council directed staff to prepare zoning changes to improve the process to deliver new rental housing in C2 and low density areas. Council also confirmed and provided further direction this past July as part of the Vancouver Plan Quick Starts Action Report, directing staff to bring back these proposed zoning changes to public hearing this fall. Why do we need new market rental housing? There's been very little rental built over the past 40 years, with over 80% of the stock built prior to 1980. Although we've increased construction over this last decade with the introduction of rental incentive programs, we're still playing catch up in a big way. 
and vacancy rates continue to be low, averaging about 0.9% over the last 10 years. One of the challenges is that the city's approval process favors ownership housing. This chart shows various housing types by approval process over the last 10 years. Broadly speaking, there are two types of development approvals at the city for new construction. One is a rezoning that's shown in yellow. It's lengthier, more expensive, and more customized. The other process is a development permit shown in green. It's shorter, the rules are clearer, and defined directly in the zoning. You can see currently the majority of rental projects are required to go through the longer rezoning process, while townhouses and condo projects tend to go straight to development permit. There's also a much higher volume of new single family and duplex ownership housing permits, 9,000 permits over the last 10 years, and 100% of these low density developments go through a shorter development permit process. The recent Provincial Expert Panel on Housing Supply and Affordability speaks to this issue, highlighting the need across municipalities to speed up approvals to address current housing challenges. So in response to these issues, the next few slides will walk you through the proposal to streamline the process for rental development and to strategically locate more rental in locations near shopping and daily needs. The changes are proposed in local shopping areas, C2 zones shown in pink, and low density, those are the RS and RT zones close to shopping, parks, and schools shown in blue on this illustration. First, let's look at the shopping street. What's currently allowed to be built under existing zoning is four-story mixed-use strata. Six-story rentals are allowed, but through a longer rezoning process. In low density areas, under existing zoning, almost all new development has been for laneway houses, duplexes, and character infills. So what's being proposed? On local shopping streets, the proposal is for six-story mixed-use rental without rezoning, as well as changes to enhance the public realm by requiring wider sidewalks, continuous weather protection, while mitigating shadow impacts on the shopping street. The proposal encourages greener buildings through simpler forms that require less shaping, making it easier to achieve green building standards such as passive house and zero emission buildings. These changes will strengthen shopping areas by having minimum commercial space requirements and encourage higher ground floor commercial units to accommodate a variety of shops such as restaurants. Over time, these changes will result in a higher customer base to support local businesses. In addition, there is an opportunity on arterials to expand retail and the shopping street into adjacent low density areas currently zoned RS and RT by including mixed use options for four story market rental and six story rental with a percentage of units secured at below market rents. These forms mirror what's proposed in C2, but expand them into the adjacent low density areas. Extending these shopping areas will provide greater retail opportunities for residents without redeveloping sites that already have existing retail. These projects will still require rezoning, but it will be a simpler process through the use of standardized zones. Turning to the low-density arterial streets zoned RSRT next to shopping, we're proposing a five-story market rental option and a six-story option with 20% of the units secured permanently at below market rents. These projects still require rezoning, but through a shorter process with the use of standardized zones. The rationale is to provide more housing choice, locating it near shopping areas close to daily needs and access to transit. Again, same as in the commercial areas, we're introducing simpler forms to make it easier to achieve zero emission buildings. We also look to livability and are introducing maximum building depths to prevent overly deep units. As well, we know that family size units are easier to achieve in simpler building forms with less setbacks. Now looking at the local street, a block off, our, uh, a block off the arterials behind commercial, the proposal is for a series of missing middle forms for rental from four story apartment buildings to townhouses and multiplexes. Change to neighborhoods will be incremental as we've included limits to assemblies, ensuring there are opportunities and options for single lot developments. 
as well as requirements to limit the building depth. Just like in the previous slides, we're proposing simpler forms as well as surface parking options to meet climate emergency goals. And finally, in terms of livability, an additional benefit to locating houses on local streets is that it's away from noise and air pollution. Overall, these two sets of zoning changes together in C2 and adjacent low density areas will start to create more complete neighborhoods around local shopping areas to encourage walkability and livability, as well as to achieve multiple council objectives to increase rental housing by creating a diverse range of missing middle rental options, introduce more clarity around our development processes, greener buildings, while supporting local shopping areas, some of which have been struggling in recent years by creating a bigger customer base. Over time, this will create more vibrant local shopping areas and neighborhood hubs by prioritizing livability, the public realm, and by adding more residents close by. These changes are aligned with the goals of the Vancouver Plan, including becoming a more sustainable, carbon-neutral city, an affordable city, as well as creating complete and connected neighborhoods. In addition, these changes are aligned with the, climate, er, with the city's climate emergency action plan to reduce carbon pollution, including Big Move 1 and 2, to create more complete neighborhoods where people can walk to their daily needs and have access to transit, Big Move 4, creating greener buildings through requirements for zero emissions and hot water, and by encouraging wood frame construction, which has less embodied carbon pollution than concrete. These next few slides will go through the more technical details of the zoning changes. So recommendations A, C, and D in the report are proposing amendments to the C2 districts outside of community plan areas to include a six-story rental option without rezoning. The maximum is six stories and the FSR is between 3.5 to 3.7 on larger corner sites. The maximum height is 72 feet if higher ceilings are proposed on the ground floor. Minimum retail space requirement is 0.35 FSR, as well as uh, increased front yard setbacks to improve the public realm. The current requirements for family housing and green buildings through rezonings will be carried over into the district schedules. In addition, we'll be making minor amendments to all the C2 areas, that's the base zoning, to align the public realm improvements for wider sidewalks, as well as the commercial retail enhancements for minimum retail space requirements and higher ceilings. Second, we're creating three new rental zones to be used for simplified rezonings in low density areas next to local shopping. This is recommendation A, B and E in the report. The first zone, RR1, are the off arterial options for three to four story townhouses and three story multiplexes. The densities range from one to 1 1.45 FSR. The second zone, RR2, is for apartment rental forms. On arterials, there is a five and six story form. There's also a four story option, which can be on or off arterials. The densities range from 1.75 to 2.4 FSR, going up to three FSR for social housing. The third zone is RR3, which is the mixed use rental buildings on arterials with retail on the ground floor. There's a four and six story option with a maximum density of up to 3.5 FSR for the six story form to align with the changes proposed in C2. Again, for the low density areas, rezoning is still required, but it's simplified, much like the RM8 zones for townhouses under the Canby plan. As a result of the zoning changes just described, we're proposing some consequential changes to the secure rental policy, which is recommendation F in this report. This is an updated map that shows shopping in red uh, and sites in low density areas eligible for simplified rezonings are in blue. The dark blue are the arterial roads and the light blue are the off arterial locations. The updated locational criteria requires eligible sites to be within the first full block of an arterial road with transit, as well as within a short five minute walk of a neighborhood shopping area. As part of this work, we tested the levels of affordability that could be achieved based on the densities proposed. We found in the RS and RT zoned areas that some additional level of affordability beyond market rental could be achieved in the six story forms. Based on testing, we're proposing that a minimum of 20% of the building be permanently secured as below market rental. 
For 100% residential buildings, we're proposing 10% below CMHC average market rents for the city, which represents a 30% discount off new market rents. For mixed-use buildings with a higher 3.4 FSR density, we can achieve a bit more affordability. So the maximum starting rents proposed are 20% below average market rents, which represents a 40% discount to new market rents. In addition, we are also proposing a form of vacancy control at unit turnover. The rents have to be reset to the same discount to current year CMHC rents. We did test if deeper levels of affordability would be possible, but found that significantly more density would be needed, which would push the buildings into higher concrete forms. Let's look at the affordability of the below market rental units proposed and how this translates into rents and incomes. The gray bar on the graph are the new market rents and the salmon and green bars are the rents of the below market units at a 10 and 20% discount from average CMHC rents. The incomes that will be served by these rents range from 42,000 to 97,000. For comparison, this chart adds in the median housing costs of ownership for east side condos shown in the dotted purple bar, which are higher compared to rental. The incomes required range from 86,000 to 217,000. In addition, a significant down payment of between 82,000 to 212,000 is needed upfront in order to gain entry into ownership. We are also proposing social housing on arterials. 100% social housing projects can receive additional density up to three FSR and six stories through the new rental schedules. This next section goes over our engagement findings. So starting at the broader city level, there's been significant engagement completed as part of the Vancouver plan process that's relevant to this work through multiple surveys, stakeholder workshops, as well as nine My City, My Neighbourhood workshops and six Sketching the Future Design workshops. The key themes we heard around housing was the need for more affordable housing options across the city, strong support for the concept of complete neighbourhoods, including more missing middle forms of housing so that people can live close to their daily needs, have access to grocery stores, restaurants, and be part of vibrant communities where they can make strong social connections. Turning to more specific engagement, since November 2019, when we started this implementation work up to the public hearing, there have been over 20,000 20, points of contact and many engagement opportunities with residents, organizations, and stakeholders through a range of different methods. Roughly 3,500 residents participated in surveys, meetings, and information sessions. In 2020, pre-COVID, we had six in-person information sessions in locations across the city. In 2021, we adjusted our methods to go all virtual and held two virtual public information sessions, as well as 40 one-to-one -one meetings with the public, stakeholder, and the industry. In addition, we also held over 25 stakeholder and advisory meetings. In terms of no notification methods, we put up posters at community centers and libraries, and we did targeted social media, which received over 107,000 impressions, as well as notified through our various email lists, newspapers, as well as providing information on the city's website. We heard from a good representation of homeowners, 47% and 44% renters. This map shows where we've held the in-person information sessions in March of 2020, as well as where respondents lived from those who completed our spring 2021 survey, where there was a good distribution of responses by neighborhood. Overall, we heard broad support to streamline the development process to deliver rental faster, as well as support for creating more complete neighborhoods by adding missing middle forms in areas close to shopping and transit. We received broad support to engage new to encourage new secure rental housing in more neighborhoods, including 72% support for more market rental, below market rental, and social housing. We did note a difference in perspective between renters and owners. There was more support for the proposals from renters overall with 83% support, with many emphasizing the importance of living in secure rental housing as compared to secondary rental, um, as well as very strong support to have rental options off arterials on local streets away from noise and pollution. We also heard that the proposals were too modest and didn't go far enough into the neighborhoods. Some felt that shadow impact shouldn't be a main concern when compared to providing more housing affordability. 
From homeowners, we received majority support for the proposal at 51%. We did hear concerns expressed over shadowing, loss of views, negative impacts on property values, as well as concerns over the pace of change and loss of neighborhood character. We also received specific feedback on the C2 changes and low density changes. In the commercial areas, we received broad support for allowing up to six story rental, as well as the, the proposals to improve the commercial spaces and public realm. We did hear some concern around the displacement of existing rental and commercial tenants, and around the height, scale, and shadowing of the proposed building forms. In the low density areas, we heard support for locating new rentals off arterials. Some residents didn't think the changes went far enough. In terms of concerns, they were over the building design and shadow impacts, particularly off arterials. In some areas, we heard concerns over the loss of character and heritage and over the displacement of renters living in secondary suites. In addition, we found there was confusion from residents that thought this was a brand new policy and didn't realize the ability to propose rental in these locations have already been allowed for a decade. There was also confusion as to whether rezonings would still be required. So the next few slides will summarize how we've changed the proposal based on the concerns we heard. First, in response to concerns around the impact of renter displacement, a number of recent city actions have been undertaken to increase renter protection. In C2 areas, we extended the rental housing stock official development plan, which requires one-for-one -one rental replacement in these areas. We also increased our tenant protection policy in 2019, which expanded protection to tenants living in secondary rental in low-density areas involving assemblies. We analyzed the development trends in these areas since 2012 and found the biggest displacement risk to renter in these low-density areas is through the tearing down and building of new single-family houses and duplex. We estimate the loss range from 420 to 660 units. This is 10 times higher compared to the loss of rental due to the building of new rental apartments, which totaled 49 units and is offset by a gain of 900 units in the same period. It's also important to note that renters displaced by redevelopment to new single family houses and duplexes do not get the added protection of the tenant relocation and protection policy. New ownership house construction will continue to be the primary driver of renter displacement in these areas, whereas these proposals create a significant net gain in new secure rental housing, provides existing renters with more protection, and results in lower numbers of secondary rental units demolished in comparison. In response to concerns around displacement of local businesses, we have included opportunities to increase retail in areas adjacent to C2 areas so as not to displace existing businesses. Work on the development of a new commercial tenant assistance policy is underway to help commercial tenants with relocation. This includes development of information and educational resources to assist commercial tenants with relocation planning, including tips for finding and leasing a new space that will work for them. Consultation is happening this month with a council report back following the consultation. Finally, in response to the concerns we heard around the pace of change, loss of character homes and renter displacement, staff have refined the eligibility map in the secure rental policy. The map on the left shows the original eligibility map under the 2012 Affordable Housing Choices Interim Rezoning Policy, which allowed rezonings in low density areas within 100 meters of an arterial citywide. In response to public feedback, the new proposed map narrows the total eligibility area in comparison and removes the RT5, RT7, RT8, and RT10 zones, which contain more heritage, character homes, and secondary suites in Kitsilano and Kensington Cedar Cottage from eligibility. We have also pulled back, on, pulled back to focus on locations in close proximity to public transit, local shopping areas, and other daily needs that support walkability. In summary, tonight's application from the General Manager of Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability to amend the C2 district schedules and to create three new rental schedules to be used for simplified rezonings are intended to make it easier to build rental projects increase housing choice for renters through new missing middle rental forms that will gradually integrate with existing neighborhoods, as well as to promote complete neighborhoods and respond to the climate emergency. 
So thank you. That concludes the presentation. And for council questions, I'm joined by a full staff team in PDS, as well as Blair Erb from Coriolis Consulting, who conducted the financial testing on the proposal. Thank you very much uh, for that complete uh, presentation and explanation of the policy. Um, we are, uh, there is no application team here for this. So um, we are going to, uh, Council, my uh, computer is just, uh, my, um, my remote computer has crashed or something. So I'm going to have to ask clerks to get IT to try to fix that for me. Um, perhaps they can help me with a questions list. Uh, clerks, do you have uh, a list of uh, councillors who wish to ask questions to this? And I'll just time it remotely. Uh, yes, at the moment we have Councillor Kirby Young, Councillor Dominato, Councillor Hardwick, Councillor Fry, and Councillor Swanson on the speakers list on question queue. So I can advance them and time them if you'd Great. like. Thank you so much. So we'll start with uh, Councillor Kirby Young. And if you could put me on the list for questions too, please, uh, clerks. Okay, thanks, Mayor. And thank you, staff, for the presentation. I have a number of questions. Uh, one of the concerns that I have heard, it relates to the notion of affordability. And I heard you say that the, the and I quote, the low risk of renter displacement due to new rental development um, and suggested, you're saying that if council, for example, were not to adopt this policy, am I correct in reflecting back to you that you are saying that threat of redevelopment from new houses, duplexes, or other ownership housing would actually pose a greater risk to loss of affordable rental than this policy would? Analysis that we've completed, um, we, there has been, uh, there is a, a lot more permits that are um, currently uh, taken out for the construction of new single family houses and duplexes. Does that analysis take into account potential um, ideas that people have that this would generate lot assemblies, for example, and therefore result in loss of affording existing affording rental stock? So we have done an analysis and based on last 10 years of development under the existing AHC policy, we have seen um, a loss of 49 rental units over the, that period. So, you know, that compared to the, you know, approximately 1,700 permits that are taken out on the, re, um, on, uh, on the um, redevelopment of single family houses and duplexes. Okay. Um, with respect to, you also mentioned limited assembly in this report with respect to the fact that there was sort of parameters built in. Can you expand on what you meant by that? Yes, so there is, um, there is um, some, we, we have some controls on the assemblies, which I can maybe get Marie to speak about in terms of the low density areas. Um, so there's a range of options on the table from one lot developments to, to some assemblies. Uh, thank you, Edna. Uh, so as Edna mentioned, the uh, low density transition areas, the local streets have options ranging from single lot development for multiplexes to townhouses and apartments, which do require assembly. We have uh, worked hard in our regulations to manage the scale of the buildings on the assembled sites. So for arterial streets, buildings are required to be broken into individual buildings, a series of individual buildings rather than one large uh, building when there is a big assembly. And on the local streets, there is a cap on the assembly size of uh, 100 feet or approximately three lots. And uh, both these measures are intended uh, to manage the scale uh, of the new developments and, and better incorporate the apartments into uh, the low density uh, detached house context. Okay, so in addition to sort of respecting the character of the neighborhoods, as you've mentioned with the, the assembly, um, parameters or sort of um, dampeners, if I can frame it that way. And just reflecting back that I also heard that the only forms that would be permitted off our tier would be three to four story townhomes, three story multiplex or four story rental. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so these larger six story would be arterial only. 
That's correct. The five and six story buildings are for arterial streets only. Okay, and can you go back to the slide that you had with respect to the rents and the affordability piece? Where you were showing the below market rents um, and CMHG rents and new ones. And can you walk through the math for me? Because I wasn't clear on the, the peach and the green bars that show the 10 and 20% discount and what that, that's discounting from. It appears to be a more significant discount to the gray bars. I just want to get clarity on that. Okay. Market so, rents. So th this is the slide? Yes? That's right. Yep. Okay. So the gray bars are the um, market rents, um, and based on uh, CMHC new market rents, um, and the salmon and green bars are the proposed below market rents. So these will apply to the six-story um, arterial options, um, and. The pink bar. Can you just say quickly in the time that I have left, like uh, that doesn't, that's more than 10%. So that's my question. It doesn't equate to 10 or 20 off of 1653, for example, in the studio example. Uh, so the, the, the pink bar is a 10% off CMHC average rents. And then the, the, the green is a 20% discount off average rents. Is there possible there's an error in that slide? Because that's not 10%. Uh, so um, no, so the gray bar is not average rents. The gray bar is new market rents. So that, that's, okay. that's the difference. Um, so the salmon bar is actually, if you compare it to the gray bar, it's a 30% discount from new market rents. And the green bar is actually a 40% discount off new market rents. We're just, okay. we're, yeah, it's, it's just how we're expressing it as average market rents versus new market rents. So sorry for the confusion. Okay, I'm sorry I'm out of time, but thank you. Sorry, clerks, my uh, computer still isn't up and working. Uh, can we move to the next uh, set of questions? I think from Councillor Dominov. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to follow up on the question that Councillor Kirby Young asked, and it's with respect to the um, uh, the caps on land assemblies. Does that exist today, the controls that you were referencing? Uh, no, they don't. Okay, this so that, that's... That's new for Sorry, this policy, yeah. Okay, uh, but no new it, not beyond this policy. New in terms of the our development landscape in the city. Well, it's it's specific to this planning program in terms of you know what we thought was um, uh, would would be the best thing to do here. Um, there's different assembly requirements across the city depending on on the planning program. Okay, thanks. That's great. Thanks. Um, I'm hoping maybe staff could expand. I know it's referenced in some of the, the Q&A um, towards the end of the report, uh, the land economics, because we've had a number of residents write us and express concerns about uh, land inflation. And maybe do we have staff that could speak to that? And, and what are the implications for a, a program of this type? Absolutely. We actually have Blair Herb um, on the WebEx who can uh, go through the uh, economic testing uh, that he um, he did for this proposal and of all the different housing forms that we're proposing. Blair? Uh, hi, Councillor Dominato. Blair Herb here from Coriolis. Uh, I'll address your, try to address your question about um, impact on land values is what I, I think I heard. Um, so we tested quite a wide range of different scenarios with staff for the, the rental um, options being considered. And, and what we effectively found is that at the, the higher end of the densities being proposed for the new zoning districts, we wouldn't expect there to be any significant upward pressure on, that, uh, on land values beyond the current single family property values or RT property values in these locations. Um, there may be some, uh, particularly in um, pockets of the city where uh, rents are particularly high um, and and lots are particularly large, and, and that really means uh, parts of the west side of the city may see some upward pressure. But generally speaking, we don't see any reason for property values to go up materially due to these zoning districts. Okay, uh, thanks for that. <clears throat> Excuse me, I appreciate that. Um, I know there may be other questions on that, so I'll, I'll move along. Um, could staff speak to, um, in the context of this proposal, um, I think we've seen with rental projects uh, that the um, the DCLs are waived, not the utility DCLs, but the other DCLs. 
is that contemplated here? So uh, it, with this proposal, we're not recommending any changes to the DCL um, waivers. Uh, we did find during the, when we did our um, rental, a 10 year rental review of the rental incentives in 2018, that the DCL waiver was still an important incentive that was needed to make rental projects viable, particularly in the, on the east side of the city. Okay, so could, sorry, sorry, so, uh, so in this context of this proposal, what would we potentially be looking at with um, simplified rezonings? Uh, so in terms of simplified rezonings, this will work much like the um, Canby townhouse rezonings where you would still, the public would, you would still require, be required to do a rezoning, um, but you, rather than rezoning to a CD1, which is customized and, indivi and individualized, it would be to a specific zone. And then, um, so it, it would be uh, a shorter process and a lot of the uh, former development um, issues would be dealt with at the development permit process stage. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll circle back on the DCL question later. Um, I want to um, move on to a question around um, the focus here is on rental, but is there an opportunity within this framework for rent to own? Uh, not specifically in in this uh, in this proposal. Uh, all of these units here are uh, secured through a housing agreement for uh, the life of the building. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then in terms of um, the built form in the map, uh, the visuals you had, you demonstrated sort of potentially four-story um, apartments, uh, fourplexes, uh, stacked townhomes. Is, would it be basically open to um, the property owner or developer to determine what they'd like? Do we have any influence in terms of that or that's just the mix of the permissible and we'd really have to depend on um, the will of the property owner in, in developing the built form? Uh, um, you know, we proposed all these options to provide flexibility depending on the, the context. So it is up to the individual owner as to, you know, what they're, what they're interested in and obviously the, the viability of, of, you know, their situation. Okay, thanks. I, I'm trying to get at is there a way to incent more of sort of that ground oriented um, housing, which is more the stacked um, townhomes, row homes in the context of uh, this proposal, if there's a tool to do that. Uh, and I'm not sure about my time. I don't, I'm not sure he's keeping the time right now. I am. And you have uh, eight seconds, five seconds. Can staff answer uh, that quickly? Um, there, there is. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Apologies, Councillor Dan Garrison um, uh, from uh, Assistant Director of Housing Policy. Just trying to be really quick here. Um, I, I think in this proposal, it's primarily um, the, the most viable forms we're proposing are the apartment forms. We have included the lower density ground oriented forms um, it, as options for people to pursue. Uh, we do think that those may be viable for uh, sort of family situations like you see a lot with laneway houses. Um, it's going to be tough for those ones to be commercially viable in a really wide scale uh, given the rental nature. Of course, at that scale of development and as uh, uh, you've indicated support for in the past and other members of council, we can look at ownership op options through the Vancouver plan as well um, through subsequent work. But this policy is focused on rental um, it will will provide those opportunities, but it's going to be a little bit challenging financially. We're well over. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Hardwick. Up to five. Okay, how much of an increase in zone capacity does this represent? Anybody? At current rates of construction, how many years would it take to build out all okay, the Councillor Hardwick, you'll you just have to give staff a chance to answer. So okay. your first question. I'd be very interested to hear the answer to that first question. How much of an increase in zone capacity does this represent? Councillor, we, uh, we haven't calculated this in terms of increases in zone capacity. Um, we've just uh, done an estimate based on past uh, our experience over the last 10 years of what the um, level of production that these policies could generate. And so we've estimated that there's a potential for another 4,700 units, about 2,700 of that in the C2 proposals, possibly up to 2,000 in the lower density areas. But we haven't done that as a percentage of zone capacity or, or that sort of analysis. 
Well, I can understand why, since you haven't provided zone capacity numbers to date, but at current rates of construction, how many years would it take to build out all the extra density units that are proposed in this plan? We've only estimated it so far for the first uh, 10 years, and that's based on our experience as these policies and, and uh, zoning amendments are essentially similar to putting in place and expediting a process for what we've seen in these areas in the last 10 years. We've just estimated um, over the next 10 years what the delivery would be, as I said. Okay. So if staff can't provide this information, why are we making such a major policy cho choice without good data? Well, we, where we do, we think we have very good data is on the need for rental housing. Um, we have not, uh, uh, you're correct, done the zone capacity analysis, but we do know um, that we've seen over the last census period, 76% of the net new households were renter households. Um, the majority of construction in the city uh, continued to be um, ownership housing. And so we are looking at ways to expand to meet the supply and meet the demand for rental housing purpose-built rental housing. Correct. Given what's happened at West King Edward and Dunbar, among other places, why is staff suggesting that there will be no serious land lift? At that location, proposed rental development has more than doubled land values. I think we, we heard from our uh, economics uh, consultants or uh, development uh, economics consultant Blair a moment ago that we've tested a range of proposals here and not found any uh, significant uplift in land value. If there are, um, you know, there will be times in the market where, where uh, owners and potentially folks in real estate and buyers speculate. Um, but uh, we found through the work we've done and the analysis we've done here, um, that there is, uh, there is no or limited up, uh, upward pressure on land values as a result of these policies. Uh, that that flies in the face of everything I've seen. So given the, the risks of a major giveaway of land lift, should this type of pro proposal not be pilot tested in certain designated areas first? The way the city, that way the city will know whether it's giving away a massive amounts uh, before it does so, rather than just simply hoping or aspiring to use one of the favorite words against the evidence that it won't. Well, I guess I would just say that the, the proposals that are before you today um, are the outcomes of pilot programs. The affordable housing choices interim rezoning policy was a pilot program to look at opportunities uh, in a limited way to deliver affordable rental housing in these areas. And we did not find significant land lift in any of the rezonings that came through under that policy. In the C2 zoning districts, we've actually uh, exempted those projects from CACs because we found over 10 years um, uh, we didn't find land lift uh, in a single project of doing a CAC and, and pro forma assessment of, of all of the rezonings. So then if we go and we get those examples and we look at them through BC assessment and we look that every time on July 1st, BC assessment comes in and reassesses those properties on highest and best use, you're trying to tell me that we're not going to. Sounds kind of like a debate, Councillor Hardwick. So no, I'm asking, I'm saying seriously, are you seriously saying that? Because then that is a challenge to people because it, it, it flies in the face of everything we know. So I'm asking the question, will you provide that for um, cross analysis? Staff? Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor, could you uh, repeat what you're asking? Yeah, to where provide? you're saying there's no land lift and you have evidence that there's no land lift, are you prepared to prove it? But it, the, our assertion that there's no land lift um, can be found in one of the appendices of the report where the uh, Blair Herb our, uh, from Coriolis Consulting outlines the findings of the financial testing that he did to support the project uh, or the, okay, the well policy then. proposals today. So this is in the, in the report um, before you. Okay, so we're just taking their word for it, but it would be possible then to... Um, point of, to point of order. Cross can we, evaluate. Point of order. Sorry, Councillor. Uh, can can we not cast this? We may have differing opinions, but could we not cast dispersions on the experts or the staff that are offering their input to the process? Sorry, just on the point of is order. Is it you, possible you, you, to cross? Uh, excuse me, Councillors. Uh, excuse, excuse me, Councillors. It's not point a, order. Points yeah. of order require a specific uh, section of the charter in order to be uh, acknowledged or, or ruled upon. So I'm going to go back to Councillor Hardwick, but I would say it's it's not debate Councillor Hardwick. This is a, 
Under this quasi-judicial hearing, this is a factual exploration that we have plenty of time for debate after the motion is moved. And I'm all into the facts. That's what I'm getting at, but my time is up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bly, uh, up to five. Thanks very much, Mayor. I just want to reflect a few um, questions that we may hear from um, the speakers that are coming up next, um, just to get some advanced answers on some of the questions that we've seen in written correspondence. And one of them is, um, is the concern around the um, low density rent, the, the part of the policy that speaks to the low density on, on uh, local streets, I think is how it's referred to. And, and that refer in that extending that policy extending to areas that are currently exempt from this um, report. Can staff comment on that concern, how you'd respond to that? Uh, thanks for the question, Graham Anderson, Housing Policy. Um, just a point of clarification. So what we've actually done in the updated proposal is to exempt some of the RT zones in Kitsilano and Kensington Cedar Cottage that were formerly included. I'm aware of that. So I just want to make, we have very limited time and a number of questions. So I'm aware of that. I'm just asking concerns from the pres residents is that once this policy passes in one or two years, let's say next council, that that will then extend to other areas that are currently exempt. Can staff respond to that concern? Uh, I'm not sure that we heard that concern. Um, we did hear and, and base that decision to remove the RT zones um, on the basis of concerns about potential for loss of existing secondary rental and potential impacts on character and heritage homes in those RT zones, which is why we elected to propose that they be removed from the policy. Um, a, a future decision could be taken to reevaluate that, um, but at this time, that's what we're recommending for the policy. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question is around um, um, highest and best use and residents have um, expressed concern that they will be taxed to highest and best use over time and we're talking maybe in 10 years. What's the likelihood or, or, or not at all likely that that could occur that people may be concerned with? So, um, We've done the testing to sh uh, and the results have shown that there isn't uh, expected to be an increase in land values as a result of this, this policy. Um, but perhaps our consultant Blair can comment further on his work. And, sure thing. And Blair, I was actually just about to ask you a follow-up question if I can pose that and that could be folded into your responses. What proportion of new homes might be townhomes? Could council expect maybe townhomes or row homes versus four-story rental buildings? Hi, Councillor Bly, it's uh, Blair Herb here again. Um, so first part of that question was related again to the topic of assessed values. So all, all of the work we've done suggests that there should not be substantial upward pressure on existing single family home or duplex lot values due to these proposed zoning districts. Um, Mr. Garrison, I think uh, quite rightly outlined that it's hard to know exactly what it any particular developer will bid for a house, but um, our work suggests that there's not uh, uplift in any significant way on, on, on most properties in the city of Vancouver due to these proposed zoning districts. Um, if it turns out, you know, BC assessment bases their assessments on actual land transactions. So if, if it does turn out that some developers are, are um, bidding up the price of houses, then it is possible that assessments will go up over time because BC uh, assessment bases their assessments on actual market transactions. Um, if that happens, uh, homeowners who have owned their home for 10 years or more are permitted to uh, apply for what's called a, I believe a section 198 with BC assessment authority to request that their assessment be based on a house value, not development site value. Um, so that's a common occurrence in locations where uh, redevelopment is occurring. So that's the assessment answer. Your question about townhouses, our work shows that the uh, viability of rental townhouses um, is not strong. Um, it takes a very unique situation for a, a rental townhouse project to be attractive to a builder or a developer. Um, it's a possibility that some of it will proceed on, on in specific circumstances, but we wouldn't expect to see a tremendous amount of rental townhouse development. 
Okay, great. Thank you. And just a procedural question, Mayor, if I may. Yes. Will we have a second round of questions to staff after speakers? Yes, absolutely. We uh, we could always move for a second round now. Uh, we could um, wait until after speakers, and we always have a, a round of questions then. We could even have another round of questions after if we want to. So okay, there's lots of room. Great. I just want to make sure there will be a chance after we have some speakers. Great. Thank you. Thanks. I've got myself on the list for questions. Um, um uh, sorry, Mayor Stewart. If oh yes, I know you want to pause. Yes, uh, please. Sorry, yeah, clerks. Yeah, we're going to pause for twenty seconds and just uh, redo the list. Sorry about that, clerks. I let you down twice there. So, thanks for jumping in. Uh, so I guess I'm not next. It's uh, Councillor Fry and Councillor Swanson and myself. Yeah, and we're ready to go. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so Councillor Fry, you're up for five minutes. Yeah, thanks, Mayor, and thanks, clerks, for juggling that. I know there was a technical glitch there, and thanks to the uh, team, staff team who were there in person today, um, answering these questions. It's great. Thank you. Great report. Uh, a lot of work that went in. Um, just curious on the DCL question. We're we're basically saying that there are no. Um, this is this is mostly going to be DCL waived projects by and large, if they're meeting the existing uh, criteria. So based on past uh, developments uh, through the SRP policy, we estimate about fifty percent of the um, uh, projects take up the DCL waiver. So we would anticipate that that trend probably to continue. Okay. Are, are, are we considering any kind of rate of change mechanism? And in, in particular, I'm looking at some of the, the orange streets like Kingsway, where we have a lot of really sort of funky, longstanding businesses and, and a vibrant business community that is also kind of a bit run down and low, low stories, uh, seems ripe for development. We contemplated anything like that? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? A, a rate of change mechanism. So the, we're not seeing, for instance, Kingsway completely redeveloped. Um, because it's 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 an affordable option and it's identified as uh, orange on the map. So no, we haven't uh, considered that um, in tonight's proposal. However, we did um, extend the rental housing stock uh, official development plan to C two areas earlier this year, and the uh, impact of that is essentially that the properties that have existing rental will. Um, likely not be um, good redevelopment candidates. So those those um, properties would be protected and you know the pace of development there would be slowed down as a result of that council action. Right, I was, I was actually thinking from a, more of a retail perspective, I appreciate that there's rental housing protections in place. I'm, I'm a little bit more concerned around the, the retail continuity and oh, protecting certainly. some of those high Yeah, streets. and we have Matt Burke here from um, the ELER work who can speak to some of the measures that uh, we're contemplating uh, in terms of businesses. Hi, good evening, Council. Uh, Matthew Burke from Economic Development Planning. I guess the, the first thing I would say in response to that is uh, the proposal tonight does uh, provide opportunities for um, uh, growth in housing and uh, mixed use in areas that are not already um, home to existing businesses. And so what that can help to do is just uh, distribute the development pressure that we might see on our arterial streets uh, to, to other areas. Okay. Um, we can come back on that one on the second round maybe, but curious then by all that same notion uh have we contemplated any any mechanisms to add retail ground level into the new rr2 and even the rr3 that we're talking about but really on the rr2 because i think there's a lot of big stretches of of um arterial street that could benefit from ground level retail in, in the interest of complete communities retail on rr2 uh, thank you, Councillor Fry, Marie Lenahan, Development Planner. Um, I take off my mask. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we didn't contemplate adding commercial to the residential apartment um, and off arterial locations. 
uh, introducing uh, commercial uh, can be challenging when there isn't a, a strong context of commercial. And we also wanted to stick with um, known typologies uh, in terms of the rental um, apartment and townhouse options. Uh, but this is certainly something that will be explored uh, through a Vancouver plan and uh, work to come at a future date. Okay, and uh, given I haven't got a lot of time, I will just circle back on the Vancouver plan. How was this work aligned with Vancouver plan? I see it kind of mentioned in some of the slides, but not as much in the engagement. Yeah, certainly. So uh, this work is aligned with the Vancouver plan in terms of um, the long-term goals around uh, increasing affordable housing um, to create... Um, uh, to address the climate emergency, as well as to create complete and connected neighborhoods. So the proposal you're seeing tonight um, is uh, directly addressing those three core goals of the Vancouver plan. And in addition, um, through the engagement, we did ask about, um, you know, uh, these concepts um, in terms of adding more uh, housing around local shopping areas and in introducing missing middle housing forms, as well as increasing um, housing options uh, and, and affordable housing options in these areas. Thank you, that's the five. Uh, Councillor Swanson. Yep, thanks. Um, I think I saw that there was only seven lots in our, our areas that would be where you think it would be financially viable to have the non -mar the below market units and um, that there were four, you're expecting 4,000 new units over the next 10 years, rental units. So I'm wondering what percent of the housing are you thinking, how many, how many non how many below market units would we get and how many non-market units do you estimate that we could get out of this? Um, we we haven't uh, done that analysis in terms of the number of below market units. Um, we think uh, we'll get, you know, overall, I think the bulk of what we would we would achieve would be the market rental units, but we do know that in certain instances um, that the below market option would be viable, and particularly in the in the mixed use option, um, you know, it, it could it could uh, work. So we do anticipate um, some take up, um, but probably the bulk of the units will be market rental. So probably not more than uh, say over ten years, not more than maybe. Uh, say 30 units a year would be below market. I mean, it, it would be hard to it would be hard to to predict that. Um, uh, but you know, we we would anticipate that the take up be uh, the bulk of it would be the market rental for sure. Okay. Um, what plans do you have to protect residents on our trails from pollution and noise? Uh, yep, we have um, Sander. You gonna take this question? Oh, Graham's gonna take this question. Thank you for the question. Um, in regards to protection from noise, so the um, existing C two zones, and as would apply to the new rental option, um, already includes some standard um, acoustic regulations to mitigate noise impacts um, in residential units on arterials. Um, as for the new RR zones, um, there's work underway as part of the regulation redesign to explore um, zoning bylaw changes that would actually add those same um, acoustic regulations to Section 10. Um, and as part of those changes, which are expected to be brought forward um, sometime mid next year, we would pr propose to apply those to the RR zones as well. Um, the timing of that should mean that th they would apply to new projects coming through this policy. So that's acoustic. What about pollution from trucks? So there's also work underway um, as part of the sustainability groups uh, work program to explore uh, potential um, zoning or policy changes to help improve uh, mitigation of traffic related air pollution um, as well as air pollution related to uh, things like forest fires. 
Um, and we do have staff from sustainability on the line that can share some more details um, about that work. Hi, Council Patrick Enright, Senior Green Building Engineer here with Sustainability Group. Um, yes, Graham is uh, correct in that we are exploring further changes to address the climate emergency um, coming to Council with recommendations coming to Council uh, next year. And within that, we are looking at measures that can address uh, for all building types, not just rental, but for all building types, uh, addressing climate resilience as well as uh, air quality um, measures such as uh, filtered air and or air conditioning. And these are measures that we can explore across uh, okay. to, across the city. Thanks. Um, can I move for a second round here before my time is up? Sure can. Do we have a seconder for that? Second, Councilor Kirby Young. Sure. Councilor Kirby Young, thanks. All in favor of a second round say yay. Yay. Okay. Any opposed? Nay. I have one nay. Um, We'll have to take a vote on this now. So I will just stop your timer. Uh, so, um, so I'll need somebody to move a motion to have a second round. I'm sorry, that was Councillor Swanson. Yep. Uh, do we have a seconder for that again? Councillor Kirby. Second, Councillor Dominato. Okay, thanks. Procedure. Councillor Tejanova. I, I had to vote nay because I couldn't debate this and there's no cue to vote on this separate motion. So is it debatable? Mayor Stewart, I thought it was. On your procedure, I'll just ask the clerks if Thanks. asking for a second round of questions is debatable. I don't believe it is, but um, I will check with clerks. Just waiting for clerks, uh, whether or not the uh, motion to, ha to have a second round of questions is debatable. No, it is not debatable. So I suspect it. Okay, so we're going to call a vote on this then. Councillor Dejanova. Okay, that's passed with Councillor Hardwick uh, posing a second round question. So we're going to go back to the main queue. Uh, Councillor Swanson, you have about 25 seconds. Yeah, for uh, Mr. Erb, I was wondering if Coriolis could give us their calculations that show that there would be no land lift for rental housing. Could you email it to us or something? Has to be in public, Councillor Swanson. So perhaps you might want to save that for your second round. To has to, it has to be uh, the public has to see all the information that we see. So but they could email uh, it to the public. The public could we could post it, right? I'll uh, I'll let uh, clerks figure out how that'll happen. But I'll, I'll uh, if you want to go back on for a second round, that we can sort that out then. Okay. Um. I'm on the queue next, and uh, clerks, or sorry, uh, staff. I have um, a question about uh, the climate emergency response, our action plan, and how it ties to this proposal. I'm just wondering if you could explain uh, big move number one. Is there a staff person there that can explain big move number one to us? Hi, Council. Uh, this is Doug Smith, uh, Director of Sustainability. And um, so big move number one is essentially complete neighborhoods, 15-minute uh, walkable neighborhoods uh, and designing communities where people uh, can have less reliance on cars and more reliance on transit, walking, cycling. Um, and this leads to not only lower greenhouse gases, but also makes for more affordable and healthier, uh, less noise, less pollution communities as well. Thanks. And is this is this uh, th this uh, proposal in front of us today considered part of the emergency uh, client emergency action plan? Yes, it is. Uh, Big move one is is envisioned to be um, 
captured within Vancouver plan. And this is one of the sort of almost the quick starts under the Vancouver plan uh, as, as Big Move One is really about land use. That's the main, uh, main uh, push for Big Move One. And, so and can you refresh us on the uh, on what the targets are, what we're trying to achieve and by what date um, in terms of this Big Move? So Big Move One is to have 90% uh, of the city be accessible, or sorry, 90% uh, of residents have access to uh, their uh, daily needs through walking, biking, or transit, uh, as opposed to having to get in a car and drive to where you need to go. And by 2030, ideally, which is a challenge with the, the speed of build, development, but that's uh, what we're working on at this point. Right, and is this, uh, in terms of Big Move One, are there other things that have come forward to council that address this? Uh, just trying to remember. I mean, this is a general policy proposal we have in front of us, so I think that's probably a fair question. Are there other like larger moves that we've had that help us achieve Big Move One? Um, well, essentially anything that looks at increasing density and, and reducing the reliance on uh, vehicles. So, uh, yeah, any develop any any development along those lines would support Big Move One. Okay. Um, I think that's all for now. Thanks very much. And I'll, I'll move on to the next group where I may have more uh, questions uh, regarding the uh, client emergency action plan. I'm going to move on to uh, Councillor Weave. Councillor Weave, up to five minutes. Yeah. Uh, my first question is who do we think will own most of this purpose built rental, recognizing that BC assessment showed a $100 billion gap between ownership and rental incomes in Vancouver? Over to staff. All uh, for thanks, Councillor Dan Garrison from Housing Policy. Um, generally speaking, there's a, a wide range of ownership of rental housing in Vancouver. We see the majority of rental is owned by a sort of small mom and pops and small corporations, uh, and with uh, some uh, some ownership by larger organizations like real estate investment trusts and pension companies and, and those sorts of things. But the majority of buildings at this scale tend to be owned by uh, smaller smaller corporations family businesses uh, and those sorts of things. Because we, because we are talking about a relatively small scale of rental building here. We're not talking about the, the really large rental buildings that tend to attract institutional investment. Okay, and then on that, in November 26, 2019, there was amendments on looking at rental incentive programs, kind of focusing on non-market housing um, and other opportunities for affordable home ownership, co-housing. How are those discussions incorporated in this report? Pro proposes a social housing option on arterials. So we have included a social housing option on arterials up to six stories and a slightly slight additional bump in density of up to three FSR. So uh, we did include that. And to the extent that there's funding from BC Housing, I think we could see some potential take up in that option. In terms of the affordable home ownership, um, those are um, that's work that's um, not part of this uh, this report, but it is work that's underway as part of the Vancouver plan process. Okay, and then I know you talked about the commercial tenant program, which is exciting coming back. Is there an opportunity to look at all non rental that's four stories to go to six stories with the component with commercial tenants opportunities for affordable commercial tenants? Is that something that we're looking at in that report? Um, Matt's going to answer this question. Hi, Councillor. Thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, below market rent for a uh, for profit business is not something the city uh, has typically done before. Um, and there could be uh, some big questions we might have to, to work through, um, but we will uh, potentially, we could, we could uh, raise that question in our workshop with, uh, with industry that is coming up at the end of the month. Okay, perfect, appreciate that. Um, my next one is to Blair and the team from Coriolis. Um, in the report, it talks about that we need to make these projects financially attractive for them to happen. What is financially attractive and what is the percentage that we are looking to ensure that developers, like it says in the report, generate sufficient return on their investment? 
Hi, Councillor Weeb, Blair here. Um, yeah, I think our memo described it somewhat vaguely, just basically saying that we don't think the developer is going to build a project if they can't earn some level of profit off of it. I think that's well, it a says, it says characterization. It, so, yeah, it says it needs to make yeah. it financially attractive. What is that percentage? Yeah, so, so I was just going to mention that. So um, there's a variety of metrics one can use to measure profitability for a, a rental development. So there's internal rate of return. There's um, annual return on cost. There's a development profit margin. If the developer built it and sold it, that would come into play. So generally speaking, what we're what we're trying to um, or what we're looking for um, to characterize something as viable is an IRR that's in excess of about six percent. Um, a development uh, yield annual return on cost in the early days that would be above four percent. Um, so those are those are sort of the typical minimum um, targets, and I would stress that's a minimum for most developers. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, you talked about that if properties had significant um, or larger size or larger lots or, or in areas of the city that could have a higher rental rate, they could generate a bit more of a lift. Do you think it's appropriate that we create a CAC um, for these projects to ensure well, that- just said five minutes, Councillor Weep, so I'll have to leave that for your next, uh, next round okay. of questions. Thank you. Okay, Councilor I can answer that later. I will have to leave it to the next round. We'll go to Councillor Dejanova. Thanks. I'm I'm just wondering, first of all, we do get a second round of questions after words. We definitely well. do. Okay. So just wanted to note that because I'd like to hear from the public. So I'll try and keep these questions brief. I'm just wondering if um if staff could tell me if they feel that because we have been talking about um the value of land and I know that we have to consider uh what's in front of us for recommendations in this public hearing. But because inflation and land value has been talked about, I'd like to know if staff have assessed, uh, because duplexes were mentioned in the uh, presentation, if some of the recent media coverage, um, you know, for example, a single family lot sold in 2019 in East Vancouver for $1.3 million, duplex house, housing built on it, um, each side of the duplex sold for over $1.6 million. And now neighborhood wide, if you look at what's for sale, there, you know, most homes that would be of comparable value to that $1.3 million home now have have uh, renderings of a duplex up next to it. And the, the price is extremely inflated. So I'm just wondering if this in any way intends to curb that policy and if in doing this, we're not making room for also considering other strategic zoning instead of blanket zoning, as we did with the duplex zoning. I understood the staff also said they keep their eye on that, but in the context of how it fits into this as a piece in the puzzle, I'm trying to understand if this, um, the recommendations before us for rental are to actually curb the speculation that we're seeing right now from duplex housing and the um, increased values. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor. It's a Dan Garrison housing policy. Um, certainly the um, a, an assessment of land value being uh, under RS or RT Zoning would have been part of the work that would have been done because, of course, you know, to determine uh, if there's any land lift, you have to first assess the um, you have to first assess the going in land value or the exist the land value of the existing zoning. Um, but in terms of the the approach that we're taking here, um, I think the 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 approach is to provide clarity and certainty in terms of what can can be built where rather than sort of a rezoning to a, a site specific or a, a CD1 zone. Um, where it's not necessarily clear and it's a negotiated process. We're trying to provide clarity and certainty here, both to the industry, to existing landowners, uh, and to community members and residents uh, around what would be considered in the C2 zones in the and in the areas uh, around them on and off arterial streets. And that kind of certainty and, and the securing of any additional density that's provided as rental um, is what's really intended to provide the dampening uh, in terms of any any land value increases we might see. 
Okay. And um, thanks, Dan. I'm wondering for assemblies that haven't uh, possibly or possible assemblies. So will we see uh, the duplex policy put that land up? So this would be farther out of reach or more expensive, especially if we're considering six story rental now. For the cost of the, the developer or the person assembling the land to do so. They'd I, have to buy each of those lots at a higher price. Well, so I'm gonna I'm gonna perhaps ask Blair Herb to weigh in on that just in terms of his analysis of the land value under current zoning in the RS and RT districts. Blair, that would do, be do great. you mind? Ian? Yeah, no, I'd be pleased to. Hi, Councillor Dijano. It's Blair Herb here. Um, thanks for the question. So we looked fairly very carefully at the existing value of pro uh, properties that are currently zoned uh, for RT and the single family sites that are, allow duplex uh, as part of our work. And um, I have to confess that I, I don't think we found any evidence that the um, duplex properties have a higher assessed value than just typical single family properties in the same neighborhood. Uh, on the assumption they're old, you know, older duplex properties and older single family houses. If there was a new duplex on a property, it would of course have a much higher value than, a, than an older existing. That's property. what I was talking yeah. about, but I only yeah. have 10 seconds left. So okay. maybe Sorry. if you could think about yeah. answering that question on my second round after the public, sure. that would be great. Yeah. Thank you, Blair. Okay. Yeah, thanks. thanks so much. But I appreciate that. Thank you. Councillor Boyle, you're up next. Thanks so much. Um, I have a, a number of questions as well on this. And my first one is I'm curious, staff laid out the differences between the secure rental um, proposal as it had come to council a year and a half ago, and then council sent it back for more consultation and the um, updated version today uh, seems to be, a, as staff presented, a scaled back version. I'm curious to know why it was scaled back and why we uh, lost um, potential areas to be building more rental when it sounded as though the feedback from the consultation was uh, was at least equally a mix of supportive and concerned. W why did it get scaled back? Um, thanks for the question, Councillor Boyle. So we, um, we scaled back the proposal for a um, number of reasons. Um, the big one being that we really wanted to align with um, the Vancouver plan principle of complete and connected neighborhoods. So we really wanted to um, focus the building of um, housing close to shopping areas. Um, so that's why we pulled back on the on the locations uh, to, to do that. In the okay. old, yeah, in the old AHC map, there was um, more uh, opportunity along arterials that was away from local shopping areas. So we really wanted to to pull that in and focus focus in on that, noting that the Vancouver plan process would um, have a larger conversation about change in in the neighborhoods and in the city overall. So might we expect later in the Vancouver plan, I guess, then a, a proposal for uh, more housing choices along those arterials and perhaps a, a, um, added commercial uh, so that we have more complete communities and spread out over the city? Absolutely. Those are the topics that are being discussed um, uh, right now as part of the consultation of the Vancouver plan. Okay, great. Um, I have two more questions and the first is on land values. We have been hearing in the public a comparison between the increases in land value around um, very specific site spot rezonings. And I'm wondering if our consultants can speak to the different impact that a, um, a, a site specific spot rezoning might have on land value versus this broader citywide approach. Hi, Councillor Royal, Blair Herb here. Um, so you, it, it's so dependent, your question is so dependent on what the actual rezoning is for. So as okay. you may, may be aware, you know, strata yes. rezonings can cause enormous increases in land value. Um, we're talking about rental rezoning in this case, which supports a much lower vet land value per square foot of density. Um, so, you know, all I can say is our expectation is that uh, perhaps spreading out the uh, opportunity throughout the city may, um, you know, limit the focus of, of any interest in a specific location, which okay. I, I think dampen um, speculation, if you want to use that word. Um, okay. 
but having said that, we just don't think that the zoning districts are going to cause tremendous increases in property values to begin with. Okay, that's helpful. Because Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that. And my last question is to uh, Doug Smith. I'm wondering, uh, understanding the strong connections between this proposal uh, and Big Move One in in the climate emergency plan. Can you speak to it's my understanding we need all of the big moves. So if we weren't to do this piece, are we hitting our climate goals? Uh, so short answer is no. Uh, this this big move one writ large is absolutely critical to meet our climate goals, uh, to having complete compact communities. And this particular proposal is a is the first significant project um, that we're putting in front of council related to big move one. So uh, yes, it is uh, an important project related to the Climate Emergency Action Plan. Okay, that was very clear. Uh, I appreciate that. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Mayor. Mayor, are you on mute? I'm sorry. Councillor Carr, you're up next. Thank you. Um, so, uh, one of the things we've heard from the public is a concern around dropping the public hearing process around uh, to rezone. Can you clarify um, which, in which cases we would not be requiring rezoning? I mean, I heard you clearly say um, six story, where there's currently six stories in, in or expected in, in uh, commercial areas, but is, which one, which areas or which of these proposals? would still have to go to rezoning, which ones wouldn't? Absolutely, so the the um, areas that would still, would not require rezoning are the C2 um, amendments that are looking to put the six story rental directly in the district schedules. So those will, the proposal is to no longer go through rezonings for those ones. For the rest of the, um, uh, changes that we're proposing along the arterials in in areas that are RS and RT zoned on arterials and off arterials all of those will still require a rezoning it would just be a simplified rezoning okay that's great thank you um, perfect and the and the one change we're making where that's not going to rezoning that in the C zone in those C2 zones um, they are currently all allowed six stories as it's just speeding up the process, is that? Right? So they're allowed to go to six stories under a rezoning. So we've had policy for over 10 years to allow it through, uh, through a rezoning. Um, it's not allowed currently in the district schedule itself, but we're just basically putting the same densities that we've been seeing over the last 10 years into Excellent. the zones. Okay, thanks for that clarity. Have we done an inventory of the older apartment buildings along the arterials that would be affected? I, I'm thinking in particular Fourth Avenue, Broadway, you know, so, but you know, there's a lot of older, very affordable apartments, wood frame buildings. Um, you know, I think you referred to the mom and pop ownership in, in many cases. So have we done an inventory of those buildings that might be affected by this? So uh, overall, in the in terms of existing rental, um, we have in the C2 there's um, about three percent of the uh, of the uh, stock has uh, existing rental on it. Um, in the RS and RT areas that are eligible, um, there's about uh, again it's about a couple of percent. It's only um, 3% of the entire RSRT stock that has that has rental in in those applicable areas. Okay. Um, I don't have the data on the on the actual age in front of me. Yeah, but it's it's um it's not a in terms of a, uh, a displacement framework citywide. Those these are the areas that have the least amount of um, rental apartment buildings compared to you know the RM apartment areas. Yeah, there's just those older buildings. There. So uh, why I'm interested in those is for a couple of reasons. One, they're very affordable. Um, but secondly, um, my other question around this is, uh, is uh, you know, the conclusion you're drawing that these moves are, are really in alignment with our climate emergency action uh, plan. And I, I get that in terms of complete communities. But have we thought about the loss of embodied emissions if a, a, a large number of those buildings are knocked down for the you know, higher, more dense, or, you know, arterial based or non arterial based apartment buildings. 
So um, in terms of um, uh, the larger rental buildings, the rental housing stock ODP does protect our existing rental stock. And in the C2 areas, by extending the ODP, what we've done is made rental developments you know, less viable um, overall in the C2 areas. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's kind of what we're looking at here. Um, not necessarily to to save the buildings, but to save the un, the rental units, right? One for one replacement. Uh, that that's right. However, but because the when we when we extended the ODP to the C two zones, what it did was it overall dampened um, overall development of sites that have existing rental. So you know those sites will be less likely to be redeveloped than they were previously before council made that decision. In terms of your other question about the embodied uh, emissions, uh, maybe I'll ask Doug Smith to, to comment. Uh, sure, thank you, Edna. Um, so regarding the embodied carbon, uh, whenever there is a turnover in buildings, whether it's moving from single family to, to um, more density or single family to single family, there is a, an impact on body carbons, but the overall, benefit over the life cycle of the buildings because all the new buildings are going to be very um, low carbon both operationally and also from an embodied carbon perspective the net benefit is actually uh, positive for for the environment uh, so yes there is some material we're doing our best to put in policies to reuse it but there is a net carbon benefit or, or reduction um, uh, by moving to a denser newer cleaner building yes my time thank you Thanks, Councillor Carr, and we're on to Councillor Fry. Uh, Councillor Fry, this is your second round. That is correct, Mayor. Yep, go ahead. Okay, um, I want to talk, ask some questions about parking, uh, but I'm finding that there's really scant material in in the report on on parking, and I'm curious. Uh, I mean, I see that the I think it's the RR threes are allowing surface parking. Um, but what is what is the parking strategy? Have we have we adapted our parking strategy at all to reflect parking uh, maximums in some of this, especially on arterials, knowing that parking is adding a big cost to construction? And while you're waiting, I'm, apologies for any confusion. I, I've, there's a bunch of broken links in the in the report as well on page 83 where it, it and so there, I'm I'm not finding a really clear direction on what, what we're doing with parking and this proposal. Yeah, uh, good evening, changing. Council. My name is Sander. I'm uh, with Community Planning. Uh, in regards to parking, uh, the strategy that we adopted is that uh, all of these proposals will still be um, under the standard parking requirements in the parking bylaw, uh, which for secure market rental projects um, tend to have a lower threshold of requirements uh, as compared to other residential uses. And then what we've done is that we've also um, tried to incentivize the use of uh, the TDM measures. Um, by tightening the locational criteria, we are enabling these projects to be in close proximity to uh, transit, which um, results in a 20% discount of on parking requirements. Um, and then through uh, the design guidelines, we've pointed out to uh, implementation of uh, TDM measures that they can do on site uh, to further reduce the the requirements to an additional 40%, so 60% in total uh, for full uptake. Uh, and what this does is that it's enabled um, a lot of the projects on, on, off arterial and some on arterial to be able to satisfy the parking requirements uh, as surface parking, limiting uh, the need for excavation, uh, the additional cost that comes from um, having to do underground parking, and then the um, gas greenhouse gas emissions that come from the pouring of concrete. So overall, we're trying to incentivize surface parking as a way to uh, uh, achieve our sustainability goals and also to reduce the cost of construction. Right, now that surface parking is just on the RR3s though, right? It would be RR3, uh, RR2, and RR1. The, sorry, okay. RR2 and RR1, RR3s are, are mixed-use development. And for mixed-use development, you do need to account for um, delivery um, and servicing um, at the rear of the site, and most likely those will trigger underground parking because of the lack of availability of uh, a space at the rear of the sites. Sure. Now, is there any flexibility to 
uh, developments that may be on a better transit served, especially in the C areas where we could just say, you know what, you don't need parking at all for residential? So the additional component to this is that um, the staff is also working on bringing forward to council a proposal about uh, eliminating um, parking minimums, and that should be coming in uh, in 2022. And through the explorations that we've done of the typologies being presented to you today, uh, we are um, incorporating measures to be able to align with those uh, moves in the future. So procedurally, would that be out of the out of the box on, on one of these proposals, or would it require a separate rezoning once that has been introduced in 2022? Yeah, so, so curr currently we are abiding to the requirements through the parking bylaw, and then once the um, proposal comes forward for the elimination of the parking minimums, there will be a overall like citywide amendment to the requirements that will be more in line with uh, applying TDM measures as opposed to having minimums citywide. So it would theoretically grandfather into what we're contemplating right now. It wouldn't require a separate rezoning process for... Yeah, it will be implemented as part of the, the new zones and the requirements that apply to the new zones. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. Thanks, uh, on to Councillor Swanson. Yeah, um, I've got uh, two for Coriolis and one for Doug Smith, but if I can squeeze them in here in five. So for Coriolis, um, could you, there's been stuff in the media about how land is upzoned for rental and then the price goes up and then the resulting rental housing is really expensive. So can you give some examples of places where land has been rezoned, upzoned for rental and the price of the land didn't go up? Hi, Councillor, it's Blair Herb here. Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't look into that in detail as part of this work that we were asked to do, but yes, I, I can. I mean, you, you've got in over the last couple of years, quite a number of uh, projects that have come in in um, residential areas that have, or like lower density residential areas that have proposed rental housing or a mix of rental housing and below market housing, some of which have been approved. And, and we've looked around those properties uh, in the past, and there's no, no sign that the adjacent properties have gone up in terms of assessed values. What about the actual property? Well, well, sure. I mean, the property after it's completed is worth a lot more when it's got a new building on it than what it would have been worth uh, as, a, as an older low density residential property. Okay. So I wanted to ask about you. You guys don't seem to like vacancy control very much. And I was wondering if you knew about the July change to the Residential Tenancy Act, which says that landlords can increase rents above the annual allowable limit for capital expenses, operating costs, and even for financing costs. Hi, Councillor. Um I wouldn't say we don't like vacancy control. I think we're just taking that from a portion of our memo where we said that extra density would probably be required uh, under what we're characterizing as a strict vacancy control measure. So um, I am aware of the changes to the Residential Tenancy Act. Um, the, I, I guess the details on that would unfold over time as to whether the, the tenancy branch um, did approve rent increases because of those items that you mentioned um, and, and whether that would contravene any um, housing agreements that the, the city had with the developer as, as part of a rezoning application. But um, just while I'm on this topic, my, our, our point is simply that vacancy, strict vacancy control does reduce the value of those units to the developer. Um, and then because of the value reduction in the completed building, um, in order to maintain the viability of the project, extra density is required. And, and sometimes it's a substantial amount of extra density if it results in concrete heights okay. over six stories. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. for, Doug, for Doug Smith, like I totally get that we need um, walkable communities for the environment. And I totally get that we need higher density in RS1 zones. 
But when you said, you know, the, the, the big move is that we have to have 90% of people walking to do most of their stuff, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could have a big move where 90% of residents had enough money to be able to afford the expensive rental that's going into these areas? So how do you integrate the equity part of this big move? Because it's it's looking like the staff isn't expecting very many of the units to be non-market housing or even below market housing. Right. So I, I can talk about equity in, in sustainability in general, and then maybe I'll pass it over to to Dan to carry on about how we looked at Just it for this minute. particular proposal. Um, but we do have a climate and equity working group uh, and external uh, subject matter experts who give us advice on all of our climate policies to make sure that we're not missing anything, not doing harm, and ideally making things better for, for low income and people who need more support. Just 30 seconds. Okay, I mean, that's Dan Garris chime in. Maybe I'll just add we have built in um, to the extent it's possible under the forms of development that are being proposed here under six story. Um, with the maximum of six story buildings, uh, as much affordability as can be generated um, in the below market options. But we've also included and created additional opportunities uh, that we're proposing here for nonprofits that could come in to build uh, social housing projects. So to some extent, the take up of these policies and how much uh, affordable housing gets delivered <coughs> through these policies will be dependent on uh, the activities of the nonprofit community housing sector, uh, funding from senior levels of government and, and, and the usual things that we look for to try to partner. But this, these uh, policies and zoning amendments do create um, a framework that, uh, that that funding could come into to create more affordability. Okay, thanks. Thank you, you. Councillor Weed. Yeah, my first question is to Blair. Um, recognizing that you did talk about there could be a little bit of a large lift on higher rental rate areas and larger lots, do you think it's uh, smart for us to move forward with a CAC tar target contribution charge that's extremely minimal and that staff could kind of in their annual inflationary rate adjustments change those to ensure that we are capturing the land lift to deliver the amenities we need in the neighborhoods. Hi, Councillor Blair here again. Um, so we talked to staff about that at length and, and um, what was determined is that in the locations where the, pol the policy would allow um, six story rental, um, particularly the six story mixed use rental where the densities can be quite high, um, although those do include a requirement for below market rental housing, we did identify some instances where we think there's extra land left uh, beyond uh, beyond just the, the uh, below market rental housing inclusion. Um, and so I, I do believe that the uh, staff report has, rec has identified that all six story buildings would still go through the city's um, CAC process. But do you think it'd be smart for us to do a CAC target contribution, even if it was like at a garage rate of a dollar eight per mm -hmm. square meter, just so that we'd have a mechanism that if we started to see changes in the industry or changes in the performance, that we'd be able to raise accordingly so that we could deliver the amenities that we need. Yeah, so the it's a good question. The difficulty with that, I think, is it would have to be, in, if it was going to be introduced, it would have to be on a very uh, neighborhood specific or, or almost block specific charge because the ability of these projects to support any CAC is highly dependent on the location of the rental project. So okay. it, that would be the, 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 the make it cumbersome is all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah I understand that. Uh, my mm -hmm. next question is to staff, recognizing that we are going to be doing DCL waivers for about 50% of these projects and no CACs, and we're already struggling to meet our infrastructure needs to be those complete communities. Can you talk about how we are going to fund this growth? So, um, in terms of um, uh, funding for growth, um, I do know that rental projects do pay for the UDCL now and so they are paying for important infrastructure and utility upgrades uh, in terms of the dcls um, 
when you look at the overall uh, uh, amount that's waived, it accounts for 4% of the overall DCL revenue collected that's waived. And that, you know, that has helped to create over 3,500 units of rental. Um, in terms of funding for um, growth, um, that is something that we're looking at through the 10-year uh, DCL review um, that's underway currently. So looking at um, how, you know, how do we pay for growth with our DCLs um, at the allocations. So all of that work is currently underway. Um, as well, uh, this is a topic of the Vancouver plan process uh, to develop a public investment framework. And so, you know, looking at how do we um, pay for growth um, and what other sources of funding um, are available out there is, is a topic of, of the Vancouver plan process. Okay, um, my next question is, we talked about a, a limited assembly controls. Do we have an opportunity to charge for land assemblies to capture some of that? When we are talking about, we're seeing obviously a lot of land assembly signs around the city and people um, capturing a huge amount of land lift when they do create assemblies. So do we have a funding mechanism for land assemblies and what does that look like? Hi, Councillor Dan Garrison. Um, the, really, the, the funding tools that we have are, are the primarily DCLs and CACs. We don't have the uh, land assembly um, tool. One of the things I would note is um, that from a perspective of a developer trying to uh, build properties, there can actually be land assembly premiums where um, it, it's actually more difficult for them to assemble sites. Uh, and so I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure that from a development perspective, it, it's it's necessarily more viable, except that you that you can uh, enable ad additional density by putting a larger development site together. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that we have a mechanism to do that other than through the the DCLs and and community amenity contribution. That's five. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm back on the list, and I had more questions about Big Move One. Um, so now I'm getting the, the connection with with Big Move One in a, in a general sense in terms of the climate uh, emergency action plan. But I'm wondering if staff can explain how does this actually help lower our carbon emissions? Like how how will this if we make this change and uh, neighborhoods uh, change in the way that are being proposed in this uh, staff report? How will that actually help reduce our emissions? Um, Doug Smith, uh, sustainability. Uh, so, off the top of my head, there's three ways that Big Move One helps reduce emissions. One is the compact, complete communities. It uh, reduces the reliance on vehicles. Uh, people can walk and cycle and take transit more, which is more affordable, but also reduces emissions because cars produce uh, greenhouse gases. The second thing is by uh, accelerating how quickly buildings are replaced. We're putting new buildings in place that are much greener, um, right. and so they have lower um, uh, lower operating emissions than the current buildings. A large older single family home will, will have significantly more emissions, especially per person in that home than a, a brand new apartment building. And then thirdly is embodied emissions. We're getting really good at looking at embodied emissions and ensuring that all new construction uh, minimizes the, the embodied emissions like concrete and steel going into a building. Um, and so that will also reduce life cycle emissions uh, through uh, these types of form of development. So those are the three main reasons. Thanks. And um... When I lived in the UK, when I was doing my PhD, I had a choice from living close to my university or living way out in the suburbs. But uh, my friends who chose that and bought a car quickly abandoned their cars and moved to the center of the city. Is that kind of the thinking where we, where equity might come into this too? Is that if you are able to live closer to your work and not out in, in the suburbs, uh, this may actually reduce your day-to-day -day living costs? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, one of the earlier studies done by TransLink indicated that uh, living in Vancouver can often be less expensive than living in the suburbs because of your transportation costs, uh, the fuel costs, or even the need not to have uh, two cars or even one car. Uh, so there is a significant equity piece by building dense, compact communities. Right. And um, so for this proposal, we're looking at putting more density in commercial areas. Uh, that is, you know, four to six story buildings, but with commercial underneath. And then 
behind those, the street behind is actually putting in slightly more more density. And, and that, so that's what you're saying will make the complete kind of walkable neighborhoods is is folks living around that commercial uh, space. Uh, absolutely, it will allow people to live, play, and shop, um, and do as much as possible uh, locally as possible. Uh, as opposed to driving to a mall or driving to a different municipality to do what they need to do. So, yes, right, that yeah. would be available. Thanks. And I was struck by how you answered uh, Councillor Boyle's last question was about that. Um, I just didn't quite catch all of it. You were saying that this is the first, for Big Move One, this is the first large proposal we have to address that and, and it's essential. I just wondering if you could just refresh my memory on that one. Correct. Yes. Um, for yes, this is one of the first big. Uh, this is probably this is the first big um, decision we'll have to make that will support Big Move One. There's going to be multiple other ones that'll come up later. Uh, Broadway, Jericho, other big density. But as far as a, a major new policy, this one is one that is important towards Big Move One and the first one. Okay. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, Councillor Boyle's up next. This will end our first round of questions. Thanks. Um, I, I think I just have one more question, which is I'm curious, you know, a, a lot of conversation about uh, about embodied carbon, about displacement. If council doesn't approve this policy, I assume it doesn't mean things stay the same as is forever. So what is likely to happen uh, along these stretches um, if we don't approve this policy? So if we don't approve this policy, um, six-story rentals in C2s can still go ahead, but it would be under a longer rezoning process. In the RS and RT areas, the, it's important to note that the Affordable Housing uh, Choices Interim Rezoning Policy closed, officially closed um, in, in 2019. So there would be no more opportunity to entertain any new rental projects in those RS and RT areas. So the kind of development you would see uh, would continue to be um, the tearing down and rebuilding of uh, single family houses and duplexes and laneways. Okay, and on the arterials, uh, rental could still go ahead, but with a rezoning, am I right in remembering that what we're largely see, seeing currently being built on those stretches is four story condo? So th that's right. So in the C2 areas, the four-story condos would continue to go ahead um, as they do now under existing zoning. So, you know, without a rezoning. And then in the C2 areas, uh, there's still a door for uh, six-story rental, but they would have to go through a rezoning process. And then nothing on the arterial streets that are not zoned C2, that are RS and RT, there wouldn't be a door in to do any more rentals there. Okay, so without this policy, likely what we would continue to see um, more of is single family or duplex and condos and and that's right. Like possibly still with still with displacement and still with um demolition and the um uh and the I guess you could call a waste embodied carbon from that demolition, but just with the result being new housing that is condos and single family rather than rental? That's correct. Yeah. And that, that okay. is the dominant form of development now. Okay. Uh, I will um, leave it there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Councillor Boyle. Okay, uh, Council, that's uh, two rounds of questions. Uh, no one else on the list. Uh, staff need to do some sanitation in the uh, in the uh, chambers in order to uh, for COVID uh, and speakers coming in. So we're going to take a 10 minute break and we'll be back at uh, 8 oh, let's say 8.05, get back at 
clerks, I understand we have a presentation for the first speaker, Mark White. Yes, that's correct. Great. Are we, I'm at 8.05, are we ready to go? We have quorum. Yes, we have quorum. Great, okay, thanks so much. So council, we're moving now to hear from public speakers uh, and we're gonna start with uh, a public body representative, Mark White, who is the co-chair of the Seniors Advisory Committee and he has a presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, as a resident uh, living in Vancouver, I live on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Salatooth Nations. As noted, I'm uh, uh, the co-chair of the Seniors Advisory Committee and was nominated to speak on their behalf uh, in opposition to the rec recommendations in the report as they currently stand. Uh, next slide, please. City Council has a unique opportunity to use upzoning as an important tool to advance affordable, inclusive, and accessible housing. That's desperately needed across all neighborhoods in Vancouver. As noted by Mark Lee from CCPA, uh, the city could better use its juri jurisdictional powers to incentivize and invest in non-market housing. Unfortunately, the proposed report does not directly or indirectly support any social value aspirations linked to the actual creation of significant affordable housing for seniors, people with disabilities, uh, nor will this rental housing be relevant to over 70% of the population who cannot afford the CMHC median market rental rates in their neighborhood, nor the 10% discount or 20% discount, noting that uh, uh, the city staff report showed that over the past decade, there's been a 75% increase in uh, market rentals rates. Although it is true that the plan provides an opportunity to increase social housing, it doesn't provide sufficient levers to actualize the aspiration. Based on the current CMHC and Stats Canada data, there's strong evidence that rapidly increasing unaffordable housing supply has long-term uh, negative impacts. Slide three, please. Rapid building of unaffordable housing stock contributes to higher construction costs and results in higher CMHC median market rental thresholds in the neighborhood. This indirectly results in landlords increasing rents at vacancy to match current rental conditions. Premature demolition results in the land assemblies which increase land value and results in the loss of affordability that can never be replaced by new housing. Preservation, reuse and retrofit need to be prioritized over demolition unless there's guaranteed non-market housing created that's delinked from market forces. And lastly, the current proposal lacks a clear set of mixed income principles and targets that address social justice, diversity, inclusion, and reconciliation. Locations on or near arterial hubs should be used to exemplify innovations in vegetative barriers to reduce nanoparticle pollution, create accessible pathways to support social inclusion across income ranges, age ranges, ethnocultural, sexual orientation, and reconciliation. I provided the city clerk with some additional slides that provide evidentiary support that a change in paradigm is needed. And if we can just sort of run through the next few slides till we get to slide seven. Uh, and I leave that for councillors uh, to review. Uh, in conclusion, SAC recommends that City Council has a unique opportunity to use upzoning as an effective tool to increase the provision of affordable, inclusive, accessible, non-marking market housing. SAC recommends that Council request City staff to explore fundamental changes to ensure that a minimum of 25% of any upzoning will contribute to the provision of this type of non-market housing within each neighborhood linked to social innovation and inclusion. A new paradigm is needed and current evidence is clear. 
uh, as I spoke uh, earlier about, uh, that new market rental increases construction costs, escalates land values, although I'm hearing some contradictory evidence there, or suggestions, but it excludes seniors and 70% of the people living in Vancouver. So I would recommend that the that council challenge city staff in collaboration with nonprofit community partners to create a new paradigm. And I remind them that it's important to consider complete communities must represent all income ranges in the city and the need for low income workers to work in the businesses that are there. Thank you very Thank much. You very Thank you. You do have questions. Uh, Councillor Carr, up for three minutes. Great. Good to see you in Chambers. Uh, Thank you for bye. coming. Thank you. Um, so my first question is, um, is around the statement you made that um, the goal should be to increase social housing, but there are no tools. Um, so what are the tools that you want the city to acquire or work towards with other governments that can achieve more social housing? So I, I think Mark Lee, when uh, during the Vancouver 2050 um, panel, um, uh, had discussed some opportunities, which could be uh, around uh, whether or not DCLs and CACs are the appropriate vehicles, and they may or may not be, or but could be converted into investment into non-market housing. Uh, uh, there, and so I, I leave. The, the suggestions of what those levers could be, although it appears from experts that I'm not, uh, that there might be uh, uh, important innovative levers that really address uh, the need for social inclusion. Uh, and to, uh, uh, to make hay with the few levers that the city has mm -hmm. in actually trying to build non-market housing mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you also made a statement, thank you for that, you've also, also made the statement that um, we, that retrofit fits should be prioritized over new builds. Has the committee discussed, you know, how we achieve that? Like, what are the tools? Are they, um, is it PACE financing? Is it just grants from the federal government or the provincial government? You know, what's been your discussion around how to achieve those retrofits, especially the energy efficient ones? Right. Uh, well, I know that with the past housing minister that we had discussions with, uh, that, uh, that environmental upgrades uh, were considered as being um, uh, potential for both provincial, uh, the, the provincial government, but also as part of the, housing, the federal housing strategy. Uh, I also think that there is uh, seniors as a growing demographic I've got a unique opportunity for council, if we had a seniors planner, to, uh, uh, to actually uh, um, look at opportunities of working with the federal and provincial government to actually turn some of those areas into seniors housing, which makes a lot of sense because it's close to um, uh, community amenities, shopping, uh, and public transportation. Mm. And is there a desire, for my last question, is there a desire um, that's been expressed from the Seniors Advisory Committee for purpose-built seniors housing, um, social housing, or, or, or more mixed um, into other um, developments? I think that there's, uh, there's the whole range, and we need transitional housing. We know that seniors right now are the fastest growing demographics of those at risk for shelters or homelessness, or are in fact homeless. So I think that we really need a whole spectrum. Uh, seniors, uh, and that uh, looks at other opportunities, uh, um, co-equity uh, opportunities, uh, in, uh, secondary suites for a family, et cetera. So I think that there's a whole range that, we, that needs to be explored. But specific to this plan, uh, I think that there are opportunities uh, to uh, create a portion of that housing in an upzoning so that developers invest in non-market housing at least 25%. I know that uh, Mark Lee was suggesting 33%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, um, and by extension to you and your committee members for the service you're doing to the city. Thank you so much. Mayor, you may be on mute, but I can go ahead. Okay, only done that twice tonight. Uh, yeah. Over to you, Councillor Blay. 
long day. No, it's all good. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for being here, Mark. Um, I just wanted to actually, I, you sort of, I think maybe in the interest of time, um, um, moved quite quickly through a number of slides that had an enormous amount of data on them. Um, I wonder if you just wanted to take a second to recap what's in those slides, particularly the market rental um, a percentage increase of market rental housing. Right, yeah. Uh, well, uh, what I have actually is um, in the slides on slide four, uh, it shows October 18th and October 19th figures from CMHC market rental data. Uh, and it uh, and and it's by year of construction, and so it typically shows that construction prior to 1960 that there's a there's a 30 percent um, difference in affordability uh, between older builds and uh, and new builds, and that's for bachelors, uh, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. Okay. Okay, and I wonder if on slide five you can um, talk about zone three and zone eight that you flagged as being the highest increase between the periods. And uh, I appreciate staff have brought these slides up, so that's helpful. So on slide five. Right, yes. So on slide five, um, you can see, uh, for instance, in zone three, which is downtown, and zone eight, Mount Pleasant, you see a rapid increase in build. Um, uh, during the last, uh, uh, between uh, 2001 and 2016, uh, so that you're rapidly increasing less affordable supply in a region or in a neighborhood, and that causes the CMHC market rental threshold for that neighborhood to increase as well. If we go to the next slide, you can see this is now only between um, 2015 and 2020, so it's a different period of time. But you can see within downtown and uh, Mount Pleasant, uh, they have some of the highest increases um, in uh, market rentals, um, thresh, um, market rentals, uh, median market rental um, in between those two periods. Um, and uh, there would need to be more research done to look at it from a causative perspective, but from a descriptive um, statistical uh, perspective, which is all you really get with Stats Canada. Uh, um, there are strong, it's, it's fairly strong uh, evidence that there is something going on there. Okay, great. That's that's really helpful. Um, just a quick follow up question, um, and we've discussed this at length since um, we've been considering this report over the last couple of years. But I, I'm just curious, um, there's sort of the notion that well, if we have the um, the um, tenant relocation policy in place, then um, council could feel comfortable with the fact that if um, affordable rental in the C2 zones um, um, it causes displacement that we've got the regulatory framework set up to protect those tenants. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, well, when you actually, when you look at the demographic need and you look at um, seniors, senior led households are um, uh, currently around 21% and, uh, and are estimated to be 25% uh, uh, of the demographics in the city of Vancouver by 2041. Um, uh, we're not, the idea of a one-to-one -one, uh, re replacement of affordability uh, does nothing. It, it really, uh, it only keeps the status quo. It doesn't, uh, there's no trickle-down effect uh, with unaffordable housing supply. Uh, it does not work towards complete communities. You will not have workers being able to afford to live in those communities. And therefore, the projections of the impact of uh, greenhouse gases, I think, is suspect. Okay, and just a yes or no, um, I assume you got this presentation from staff at the Seniors Advisory Committee? So we're, we're just... Uh... Is it yes or no? Uh, no, it was just online. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Up to five. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, 
one of your slides, the headline was data driven evidence to inform decision making. Is that important? <laughs> yes, I think it's the only way that we can actually move forward is through good data. And I think that there has been some very good data presented by city staff. Uh, but what has not been presented are solutions. Uh, and so I think there, uh, yes, there may be some data gaps uh, that would be great to close up. Uh, but I, I do think that city staff have done a tremendous job in, uh, in, um, in providing data, uh, but not necessarily in providing the innovation uh, needed and creativity needed to actually solve the problems of affordable housing in the city of Vancouver uh, for seniors, but also for 70% of the population that can't really afford uh, CMHC current market rental values, whether that's 10% off or even 20% off. Well, I know that CMHC have also noted uh, data gaps, but uh, riffing off of something that uh, Councillor Carr asked earlier, um, what might be some opportunities to expand non-market housing in the context of the proposal from your perspective? Well, I think one of the fa most fantastic things that uh, has happened with City Council now is the hiring of um, your new deputy manager that has 37 years experience with BC Housing. And I think that uh, through uh, that city manager and through collaboration with non-profit -house, uh, non housing providers that, uh, uh, that there could be more innovation uh, created. And I, and I strongly urge that uh, there's an opportunity for that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions for you. Thank you so much for coming in and your service to the city. Um, uh, just kind of a broad question for you first. Um, if you were thinking of buying a house, where do you think the most expensive houses are in the city? <laughs> well, uh, I think for most people it would be anywhere. Uh, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the yeah. downtown east side's the same price as, say, West Point Gray? No, no. I think that there are differences, uh, that there are differences, but I'm not sure, um, how that relates to the question at hand. Maybe. Oh, I'm getting there. Thank you. I'm getting there. Thank you so much. Right. So, so we're not really having a debate between the status quo and adding rentals to particular parts of the city. It, it's a debate between these, uh, these parts of the city that are already zoned to develop strata, uh, high price strata, or if we make these changes, we're able to bring, uh, market rental and some below, you know, a good portion of below market rental to these areas. So that's really the choice on all these public hearings when we're talking about rental. Yes. Um, would think, you agree? Uh, not exactly, because I think that um, my understanding of creating complete communities is a, a, it would be neighborhood actual involvement and in looking at what their felt needs are. When I look at Dunbar, for instance, uh, I mm -hmm. see a dying community in terms of um, clo um, uh, 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 businesses uh, having difficulty finding workers uh, and uh, uh, young people moving out of the Dunbar region because they can't afford to buy houses there. So I see an emptying out. Uh, I'm just using that as an example. And I think what we need to do is, is to really engage, and I know there's been resistance in some areas around nonprofit housing, uh, but I think that there are wonderful opportunities uh, to actually have discussions uh, and to uh, around uh, what complete communities could mean uh, in their region and what the, and what would that look like? Okay, so what would a complete community look like in Dunbar? Uh, I think that that, that it would basically uh, have um, a full mix of income ranges. Right. Um, and uh, that um, we also know in Dunbar that there's an aging community and so that there would be alternatives um, for people to either stay in their 
home and, and have secondary suites or students living there, uh, or um, to right size and look at opportunities of moving some of that into non-market housing. I know of seniors in the Dunbar area, for instance, and we've had uh, discussions with, that have said, I don't need $3.2 million if I was to sell my house. I would gladly sell it for a million dollars and donate and get a tax credit for the balance uh, and put it into a land trust. Well, that's, that's great. Um, I have a, another question about climate change. Uh, we've been told by staff earlier this evening that uh, the biggest move we have to make in our climate emergency action plan is big move one, which is create uh, complete communities. And this is the very first proposal we put forward uh, to get us partway there. So does that at all influence how you think about this? I think it's a fantastic vision. Uh, I think that all that we need to do is to uh, be able to actually have the, um, uh, to provide the affordable housing that will capture the diversity that's necessary in order to make a complete community. Okay, so, but if our choice is say on Thursday, we're voting yes or no to this, and this is the biggest choice we have in front of us for, to address climate change in terms of big step one, walkable communities, you would still think we should vote against it? Uh, I think it should be um, sent back to city staff. Uh, and uh, as, I, as the recommendation was to, to uh, engage the new city manager with BC Housing uh, experience, to involve the nonprofit uh, uh, housing community in discussions, and to look uh, at possibly some opportunities to really change the paradigm as was suggested by some of the consultants during the 2050 panel. Okay, uh, thanks so much. That's my five minutes, but I really appreciate uh, you coming in this evening. Thanks, you have Councillor Fry for five minutes. Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, hi, Mark. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, you mentioned uh, not subscribing to the idea of, of, of the trickle down sort of theory. And I, I'm inclined to agree with you that this notion that if we build more market housing, it will somehow um, trickle down. But that being said, um, I just saw somebody posted on Twitter, 500 new Amazon jobs uh, being hired, which presumably won't be filled locally. So there are gonna be new people coming to our city. We've got burgeoning all sorts of big industries that are, that are happening in Vancouver and attracting new people who have more money. So I'm curious where you see the role for new market rentals to be built and and where in the city and how we should be just dis disaggregating the notion that it will filter sure. down to sure. lower incomes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I think what I would do if I was in the city's shoes and, and has been done elsewhere, uh, Whistler being one, uh, is looking at opportunities for businesses to invest in housing, in affordable housing uh, for their employees. And I think that there's great opportunity there to look at it from a non-market uh, perspective as well. So I think that there are some creative ways of going about it. I don't think using housing as a commodity in this type of market is working for people living in Vancouver. Nope, don't, don't disagree with you there, although it's not like we have uh funders beating their beating their, our doors down to build non-market housing either so it's a bit of a delicate balance but i totally appreciate you joining us and sharing your perspective thank you so much and i really appreciate all the councillors efforts thank you uh that's it for questions and we're going to move on to the next speaker again thank you so much for your work and uh and uh coming in this evening we're um going on to the next speaker and sorry, just getting my list ready here, Council. Okay. Oh, rats. <laughs> it just got buried in my email. Sorry, Council. I'm just looking for my next. There we go. Okay. We've got uh, David Sander. Who's next? David Sander, up to five minutes. Good evening, Mayor and Stewart, members of Council. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. 
Terrific. Thank you for, for listening to uh, my comments this evening. Uh, I'm a director at Hollyburn Properties and a resident of Vancouver. I presently do not own any property that is affected by this proposed uh, public or rezoning and public hearing. Um, and so tonight I just wanted to come and share a few of my thoughts. Um, and that is that, that I do support the, the work by staff and what they've put forward today. Uh, it builds on extensive work the city has done in, in recent years around rental housing. And we all know that that Vancouver is facing an affordability crisis um, that's very per pervasive and uh, it affects all sorts of people in the city and uh, all types of housing and that includes rental housing. Um, more than half of this city rents um, and these improvements to the Vancouver rental pol policies will create a diversity of new rental housing. You know, roughly 4,000 new rental units over 10 years is significant uh, when you look at the city of Vancouver has achieved roughly around a thousand or a little under rental units uh, or year over year in recent years. And that's the, looking at the uh, total rental universe as measured by CMHC. Um, so these changes represent, uh, you know, well, roughly 400 rental units, which is a year, which is a significant uh, number and a, a strong path forward to allow for more rental in many neighborhoods across the city. The proposal today uh, will put policy into action by making important changes to streamline the delivery of rental, allowing six stories in the C2 zones and, and introducing standardized rental zones in lower density areas. Both of these changes mean that builders like myself can build new rental homes faster than before. As a builder, I wanna be part of the solution and see new and existing Vancouverites be able to find a home in many neighborhoods across these, this city. These modest changes will encourage vibrant neighborhoods and make positive changes for our ability as an industry to deliver new rental housing. So I encourage council to, to adopt these uh, propo this proposal and these changes. And, and Mayor Stewart, I think you touched on an important point earlier in your comments in that in many of these locations, developers and builders can already build there. It's incentivizing them to build six stories of rental instead of four stories of condo. And, and that's an important uh, point. And, you know, I'd like to conclude that, um, you know, there's the discussion around affordability is, is a very deep and important one. And we need more housing. We need more of all types of housing, more social housing, more below market rental housing, more affordable for ownership housing, more co-op housing, you know, the list goes on and on. And, and yes, we need more rental housing. These policies that, that are before you tonight address rental housing predominantly. And just because they don't address those other uh, types and tenures of housing that we do need uh, as deeply as you may wish is not a reason to reject the policy that's before you because we do need more rental housing. And, and I think, I hope that council sees that and votes for this um, uh, this change in policy direction. Thank you. Thanks so much. You uh, have a question from Councillor Weave. Councillor Weave. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming to speak today and give your perspective. Um, I'm wondering, um, as someone that does build, are you happy with an IRR of 6% or what is your company policy for what you try to achieve when doing a project like this? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, and in recent years, it's just that that number has been falling lower and lower and lower. And if people can deliver a six percent IRR, I mean, I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I can't get there. Um, and you know, I think that speaks to just how hard it is to unlock the sites. And there was some conversation earlier about land lists going up. Um, you know, I look at this, and and land is just so extremely expensive in this city that it that it makes it hard to to unlock the sites for redevelopment so i so the irr to answer your question directly and what what we like i mean if we can get four percent we're pretty happy with that um the the i i don't think that this policy is going to spur enormous amounts of development that are going to going to increase enormous amounts of of land or unlock huge amounts of land and and, and push land values up. I, I just don't see that that happening. I think it will help unlock a few sites, 
um, but developers aren't going to be there with six-figure checks to uh, over and above the the assessed value or the the asking price. It's going to take creativity. Okay. It's still going to take creativity on our part to to make the projects work. Um, and I liked your talk about how you want to build these complete communities. And one of the things we need is the amenities. So I'm wondering, as the development community, do you think you're more receptive to having the CAC target contributions, even if they're small, knowing that some of the value will go back into that community to deliver the, the amenities that the residents need? Yeah, speaking speaking on behalf of myself only, um, I, I get really nervous around that conversation because just having the conversation of what an appropriate CAC is can take a year. And and a, and a big part. That's of why I was saying if it's a target contribution, so you know beforehand that it's only going to be two dollars per square meter, and it's a, a nominal amount or a smaller amount, but you know prior to going into that, that there's no risk of having to do a negotiation or anything. Is that um, preferred uh, than going through the negotiated process? Like my, my my sense is is there's not enough fat in this policy that could justify that. In, in theory, having a fixed CAC I think is a terrific idea. When I look at this policy specifically, I I, I just I don't know that there's going to be enough juice there for that. Okay, thanks a lot for coming to speak today. Thanks. Uh, that's it for questions. Really appreciate you coming in this evening. Thanks. We're going to move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Helen Louie. Speaker number two. Hi, Mayor and Council. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name Thanks is Helen, and I support this policy. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep, keep going. Oh, sorry. My name is Helen. I support this policy because I know that it will add much needed rental and affordable rental. I've been a resident of Vancouver for over 10 years. I've watched friends and family move away despite growing up here just because they don't have wealthy parents who can give them down payments or were lucky enough to have been born 40 years ago. I also work for a nonprofit organization that builds and operates affordable housing, and I see firsthand the shortage of affordability. When we have projects completed, I see over four times the amount of interested applicants. These are people who are students, their families, their single parents with children, seniors, people with disabilities, and many others. But this also includes people who make way over the targeted income, and that's because they themselves can't find secure, affordable housing despite making substantial household incomes. So I don't speak for my employer, but I do speak from my own experience, and I know that this policy will bring more affordability because it's what I do. Um, I first heard about this policy in 2018, and since then, I've already had the affordability and feasibility of two projects affected due to the, the delay in enacting this policy. Both of these projects were partnerships with other local nonprofits and community organizations to bring secured below market rentals. They are the exact type of projects that I think many on this council advocate for and say that we need more of. But because the policy was delayed so many times, both projects and affordability were impacted. Both were waiting on the outcome of this policy. One of the projects became too costly for the nonprofit to continue waiting and had to be sold. A second project, instead of waiting, is now doing a rezoning, which means more cost, more risk, and less affordability in the rent. I'm sure that there are many other examples that have been made no longer feasible or delayed due to lack of action and, and lack of incentivization for affordable rental. And that's because the current conditions make it really unfeasible to develop affordable housing. There are many nonprofits and organizations out there that want to bring affordable housing to Vancouver, but they can't do it alone because of high costs. Organizations like nonprofits are being asked to pay nearly the same cost, but then deliver below market results. The city's fee waivers are helpful, but often the total of these fees are less than 5% of all the costs required to deliver a project. Provincial and federal governments are already helping with low cost financing and grants. Municipal governments need to do their part and remove roadblocks. If council is really serious about adding affordability, then they need to support the existing organizations that are already doing this, and that's what this policy does. Affordable housing providers are telling you that they need municipal support and saying that this is how you can support them deliver affordable housing. 
And so there's many people that can claim that we can tweak or revise, but they are probably also people who haven't suffered the impacts of unaffordable housing for a long time or possibly ever. Doing nothing or sending this back to staff means people, more people without homes, and it means more of the status quo, which is not affordable. So I fully support this council and I urge council to approve it if they are serious about helping nonprofits and similar organizations deliver secure, below market, affordable housing. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, there's a number of questions uh, for you, including from me. So uh, I'm just gonna start uh, quickly. Sorry, I was just wanted to make sure I heard clearly what you, you said is that uh, you were working on two nonprofit rental housing developments that would have fallen in these zones, but because of the delay, one has been sold off now to a market developer and the other one is uh, going to be more expensive because of it has to go through rezoning. Is that right? That is right, yes. And on the one that was sold off to the market uh, developer, are they just going to build condos in its place? Uh, I'm not too sure, unfortunately, um, but I do know that it was it was sold to, uh, yeah, it, it, the land had to be sold, yeah. Okay, thanks so much for that. Uh, Councillor Hardwick, you're up for five minutes. Um, I'm just curious, um, you do work in the property development industry? Uh, yes, in the property, yes. I was just curious why you didn't state that in the uh, opening. Most of the people that are uh, speaking from the industry have um, indicated their title and organization. Was there a reason that you didn't do that? Uh, just a uh, speaker, I, you don't have to answer these questions if you feel them inappropriate. Okay, I, I want to state that this is my second time calling into a public hearing. So if there's like um, like a process that I'm not following, then I'm sorry that I wasn't aware. I think part of it is like many young people who don't talk, typically call in, it can be really intimidating, but um, you know, like I hope that more people can call in and that it's not always the same people who kind of know how it all works, but that it wasn't intentional. Sorry to answer your question. Thanks, uh, Speaker. I'm just going to stop the councillor's timer here. Uh, again, I probably is my fault. I should reiterate the rules that councillors or myself will ask you questions, but you're under no obligation to uh, answer them. And uh, when you register to speak, uh, you're just required uh, to uh, your, uh, to include your name and whether or not you're a resident of Vancouver. That's uh, that's all that's required. Back to you, Councillor Hardwick. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, but um, nevertheless, this is someone that has indicated that they are employed and uh, in the property development industry and is certainly aware of it, but I will just leave it there. But I think uh, the point has been made. Thank you. Councillor Kirby-Young. Yeah, uh, thanks for calling in today. The mayor had asked my first question about the two projects, but I just wanted to, <coughs> sorry, my voice is a bit dry. Um, I just wanted to clarify, did I hear you correctly that you said you work with a nonprofit? Yes, I work for a nonprofit developer. Okay, and 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 the do you, what type of projects do you typically work on? If I if I may ask, is it is it nonprofit rental, social housing combination? Um, it ranges depending on the municipality, but most of it is um, middle missing middle housing uh, for people who. Um, it's yeah, either sorry, it's usually just below market rent. Right. So, so like that's your entire goal is to deliver below market housing where possible. Supportive. And you have Correct. expertise, yes. you work in that area every day. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to call on to council. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Weave, you're up next. Might be on mute. Yeah, um, thanks for coming. It's great to get new speakers and new perspectives and young voices. So I appreciate your calling today. Um, I'm wondering, does this report, to your point, tilt to the non-market? Like, is there abilities or what can this council do to ensure that our policies are allowing more non-market housing, um, recognizing that's our biggest need? Are there elements to this you think we could do more to help support the non-market delivery of affordable housing? 
I think that we could do more to support non-market affordable housing by making this policy more widespread and apply to more areas and sites. But I understand that there's probably its own challenges with doing that. And As is there... It stands, I know that... No, oh, sorry. No, keep going. I was just going to say, as it stands um, right now, it already adds benefit and, and options for nonprofit organizations to build more affordably. Okay. And recognizing that there's a lot of incentives for um, market rental as well, um, do you think that we should continue to find more ways to incentivize non-market, um, recognizing that it seems to be we also incentivize market rental at a pretty high rate? Um, with a lot of waivers and a lot of federal and provincial funding? I think that both are needed. Um, I can't speak to the experience of working in a market rental because I haven't done that before. But mm -hmm. I know that just from the experience of seeing the types of applicants that do apply to my projects, it's clear that not only below market is needed, but regular market rental is needed for those folks as well who don't qualify for the projects that I work on. Okay, thank you. Appreciate you coming to speak today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I think that's it for questions. Oh, no, Councillor Bly is there. Up to five minutes, Councillor Bly. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And thanks to um, Speaker Helen for, for coming in. Actually, I'm just curious, engagement is a big topic around um, this, this report and this decision before council. And I'm just curious how you came to hear about um, this report coming to public hearing tonight and um, what was your sort of, yeah, well, I guess that's the first question is how'd you come to hear about the report? Um, I am, of this year signed up for updates from the city website that distributes that information about different um, planning updates. Um, uh, to be honest, other than my own public hearings on my own projects that I attend, I previously haven't always been so engaged. So it's only been recently that I've been following this uh, planning work more closely and especially for this specific one, it's just because it was um, discussed with staff on the projects that it impacted, the ones that had delays because of this policy delay. So um, that's how I heard about it. Okay, but just to clarify, those projects were strictly non-market? Correct. Okay, so it was sort of, I hear, so like maybe there was like a suggestion that um, that there is a policy that could solve for that? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm just trying to connect the dots on how a potential policy um, that's coming before council, what I'm getting, what I'm hearing is that sort of the delays and what have you, maybe there was a discussion with staff. It's, it's, it's sort of less important. What I'm just curious about is how people are hearing about this um, report and how Others are not, and the disconnect there because that's a that's a major um, point of contention. I would say that we're hearing between industry folks and then perhaps oh, residents okay. that are affected. So I'm just trying to make connect the dots on that. If you have anything else to offer, that's great. Otherwise, I appreciate your responses. Yeah, I do have one point to add for that. I think that I probably heard about this report due to my work, and otherwise, like for example, or for example, peers in my age or people that I know that don't work in the industry would not otherwise have known about this or would come and speak. Right, that's what I'm thinking too. Okay, thanks, I'll leave it there. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Councillor Bly. Uh, that is it for questions. Thank you so much for uh, participating tonight. And we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is uh, in person council. So this may take a few minutes, uh, a few uh, seconds anyway, to uh, get everything set up. But we have speaker number three, Michael Mortensen. And uh, let the clerk signal to me when uh, everything's ready to go.
And then our next speaker, speaker number four, uh, Michael Brown, is also in person. So we may have to clean the stations in between speakers. So just to let council know, and whenever clerks uh, give me the high sign, we're speaker ready three. to go. Yeah, speaker three is ready to go. Great. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, welcome this evening. And uh, you have up to uh, five minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Do I have a presentation up? I sent one uh, in. Just check with clerks. Uh, clerks has not received a presentation. Hmm. Okay, I think I sent one in, but that's okay. I can okay. Uh, I can speak extemporaneously. Um, yeah, Michael Mortensen. I've lived in Vancouver since 1989. Uh, I've been a renter. I've been an owner. I currently don't live in Vancouver at the moment. I'm just residing out of the city for uh, the next little bit, coming back. Um, I run a development consulting company called Livable City Planning. I am a developer. I'm a developer of market housing and non-market housing. Currently, I have about 5,000 units in planning throughout the metro region. So I'm a housing expert. And... Uh, and I think, you know, how interesting, I just want to congrat, you know, uh, echo the comments of Helen and really compliment her on her fine uh, uh, testimony to you. Um, and I really suggest to you, like, wouldn't it be interesting if every single new single detached dwelling application would have to go through this process with council to justify approval of a single detached house? It would be really interesting if we inverted this question how is it that we put rental housing through this grilling process, right? When in fact we have this other 60% of our city that gets approved and rubber stamped. 300, you know, how many, the most square footage that's being developed now in Vancouver by far by area are single detached homes, replacing old single detached homes with no net new addition to the housing stock. 60% of our city, is locked into single family use it, with houses that are two million, three million, four million, five million dollars that are affordable based on income to less than 5% of Vancouver families. How is it that we're subjecting rental housing to this kind of uh, grilling? I think we need to flip that on its head. But it, I'm just going to get really quick to the need of this though. But I definitely support this policy. I think it is a modest incentive to create new rental, it is working. If you want data, if you're the frog in the pot who wants data, look around. Look at the rental rate, the vacancy rate. Look at the new supply of rental housing, which for 40 years has been absent in our city, which is just turning on now with some of council's um, incentives through the, um, through the last few years. So it is working. We are getting new rental housing. And, um, and we need to continue it. So I wanted to implore you to trust the experts that you have on your staff, in your planning department, in your real estate department. They have scrutinized the data. They have scrutinized the, the pro formas. You have objective third-party consultants. You have reports from Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, who I work for in affordable housing. Um, I am building market and non-market housing, and I know how razor thin the margins are for rental housing. We need to incent rental. We need to give rental vitamin D, vitamin density, to balance the playing field between condo uses and rental uses. There's been tons of consultation on this, on this, this, um, this policy. It's been, in, it's been in the media, and it's been before council for years. And this is a modest move. Um, I just wanted to say that, that the, the forms of housing that your staff report sketch out can be completely integrated within the DNA of all of our neighborhoods. We can still have leafy neighborhoods with lovely landscaping and charming homes. They're just going to be a little more dense, a little taller. But that the, the forms of development are completely compatible and appropriate in, on, on the arterial roads that we have and within the in internal areas of our city. I think we need to go further. I think we need to, to rezone areas around parks for multifamily, de facto, as of right. You know, why, why should those areas in high amenity parts of our city be the sole domain of single detached dwellings affordable to less than 5% of our families based on income? So this is a question of equity, economic equity, it's a question of addressing climate change by allowing people to repopulate neighborhoods that are losing people on an absolute basis. 
Dunbar Point Grey. I mean, really, these places are dying for new people um, and new residents to reinvigorate the local high streets, all within access to cycling, transit, walking. Um, we need to relax parking. If you want affordability, if you want a policy to create more affordable housing, I've heard council ask that, relax parking. Zero rate housing for GST. You should be lobbying the federal government to zero rate housing for GST. You should be lobbying the provincial government to pull back property transfer tax, which is now climbed to 5% of land. So with that, I compel you to approve this policy. It's the right thing to do. It's the ethical thing to do for environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and economic sustainability. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Carr. Great, thanks. Good to see you here. Thanks nice for coming you. in. Um, so my first question is, um, if, the, if the margins are razor thin uh, for building rental housing, why do you do it? Because, because we're incenting it with more density and it balances the playing field. So there are developers, if you read the CMHC uh, report on multifamily housing in major Canadian centres, they will tell you that generally speaking, rental housing delivers negative cash on cash returns. That's after you pay your mortgage, your net operating income, after operating expenses. There are cities like Vancouver and Toronto that have higher rents that make it just viable. But if you add costs to this, if the interest rates spike, we're gonna lose this window of opportunity to create rental housing. For four decades, we haven't seen rental housing in Vancouver. So it is marginal. We're talking about cash on cash returns. This is after you pay your mortgage, you collect your rents, you pay your operating expenses. Cash on cash returns are in the order of 1%. The rest goes into the principal portion of the mortgage. And then the, the returns after you add back the principal and before tax are about five to 6% on equity invested, right? So, the, you know, when you create a rental project, you're creating a job for yourself for the next 100 years. You're unplugging toilets. You're repainting suites. I know because I went, I went and studied with a fantastic developer named Walter Hardwick. I painted apartments with him, his apartments that he designed, planned, financed, leased for 20, 30 years with his brother. He was a developer, a, a fantastic developer and a fantastic politician. Developers are fantastic citizens. They're building amenities. The housing is the amenity. So that's my, my two cents on affordability. Okay. Um, which measures uh, that are being put forward in this report, you know, like, for example, in the C2 zones, not, not having to go through a public hearing process. So which, or, or going up to six stories, which measures are the ones that are most attractive to you in terms of enticing you to build more rental? On our arterial roads, six stories as of right for rental is, is, uh, is completely sensible. You know, think of um, Peter Miller, who you saw last year, I think, before you at 4th and Balaclava, an 80-year-old man who spent eight years of his life, 10 years of his existence on this planet trying to get a rezoning approval for a wood frame, carbon sequestering, six-story building with eight units that were below market out of 35. The guy had to spend eight years of his life to get a planning approval. This is ridiculous. We're rubber stamping single detached home redevelopment with no net addition of housing stock and zero affordability, right? And zero CACs and zero capital gains taxes paid, right? Left, right, and center. It's, it's the bulk of our approvals by square footage in this city. It's shameful. And we need to reverse that. And you, council, have the power to approve that. If you want to do something for this city and create a sustainable Vancouver, you need to approve this policy. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Councillor Fry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, hi, Michael. Maybe. Nice to hear from you here. Councillor Fry. Um, hey, so I just just listening to your comments and stuff, it seems to me, and I, the the one percent piece really struck with me. So really, the only big winners here are the banks, is what I'm feeling. You're you're kind of laying down. Uh, it, it, yeah, I get, well, you know what's making this work is low interest rates. Honestly, we have a window of opportunity to create a surge of new rental supply. But if you wait, if you dither, if you push this off, you know, we know what's going to happen to interest rates in the long run. 
Um, CMHC has been very helpful with, with rental incentive financing, RCFI, and their, their, their multi-flex mortgages. So low interest rates are key to this. Um, and frankly, we need rents. We have, we have people who are paying, you know, market housing requires market rents. If you want below market housing, you need to significantly increase the amount of vitamin D that you feed a project. You need more height, more density. That comes from the land is essentially free. You need that to balance the books. But um, yeah, banks, I don't know if banks are running away. Uh, um, you know, I heard CMHC's offering mortgages of, you know, 1% or less. Um, this is a significant public investment in rental, but the margins are very thin. So to, to what degree and what percentage of new market housing do you think should fairly be directed towards uh, below market housing? How, how do we sustain the population that just simply can't afford this market? I hear, of, yeah, I, I hear a lot of, yeah, I hear a lot of- from medium. I hear a lot of people saying that the market should provide all this, or actually, frankly, the government should provide all of our housing. So I don't know, let's take that to the Canadian taxpayers. I don't think you're gonna get a really good reception. I think we need all sectors, non-market and market. I mean, I work for CMHC in, in assisted housing with co-ops, nonprofits, seniors housing, low-income housing. I work with developers building market housing. And um, I think we need all sectors running. There is this sort of us and them, you know, thing going on here. Are you a developer? Really? Yeah, I am proudly a developer, right? I build communities. Uh, we're all in this together, and we all need to solve this problem together. I think it's government and the market. But if you want market to deliver below market housing, you have to offer them something in return. It's transactional planning. It's quid pro quo. Um, and you can do it. There are, I have lots of examples of, of, of uh, planning applications where the city has said, look, the housing is an amenity. What do we need to trade in order to get this at, at significantly below market rates? Richards and Robson, the Millennium Project at Richards and Robson, created 40, I think 40, I forget the number, 46 new self-contained uh, micro units at welfare shelter rates. And what was the trade? It was, it was nine or 10 floors on a condo tower. And those, those new units were handed to the city, brand new keys, zero risk in perpetuity at welfare shelter rates. We have a history of this. This city has perfected this over the last 10, 20, 30 years. So the answer so, is everybody, I think, Councillor Fry. So, so do you think on the scale that we're proposing with this, uh, we could do inclusionary zoning? No, it's a daydream. It's, it, you know, unicorns and fairies. Unless you offer up significantly more density, this is a modest move to incent market rental. Um, but, you know, and I think as um, the previous speaker said, nonprofits can jump in as well with the assistance of senior levels of government. They can play in this space as well. And you just heard that the absence of this policy has, is, letting, is letting projects fall off the table. Time kills all deals for market projects and for below market projects. But you know, I think you have to be careful. You cannot you cannot burden uh, marginal market rental projects with extraordinary um, below market requirements. San Francisco tried it in in 2015. They said all all of our projects are going to be 25% deeply affordable. And what happened in 2016 in the city of San Francisco? They got zero new building applications. They got less new new rental than the year before. You know, because their, 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 their planning policies weren't grounded in basic land economics. So I appeal to you, listen to your expert real estate advisors on staff, your, your expert planners, listen to CMHC and their studies, to Coriolis, to city spaces. You are armed to the teeth with compelling economic evidence that this policy is 110% needed. And you're seeing the fruits of it over the last 10 years of rental construction in, in, in Vancouver. It's starting again after a 40-year drought. That's the Thanks data so. you need to look at. Thanks so much. We're Thanks. at the five minutes. We've got uh, Councillor Hardwick for questions to the speaker. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm only uh, allowed to ask questions regarding this particular application, or I'd have some other things to say, Michael. Uh, do you believe in data-driven, evidence-based decision-making? 
Absolutely. Look at the rental rates. Look at the vacancy rates, Councillor Hardwick. Really? And I have been. And I have also been asking for information about secondary rental market, about short-term rental market, yeah. about zone capacity, about a pipeline of development. And none of this information has been forthcoming. And furthermore, CMHC have noted that they have serious data gaps in their understanding. So do question. you not think that it would be um, more prudent uh, you talk about basic land economics and fail to understand the impact of precipitous upzoning in land inflation. Sorry, is that a question, Councillor Harvick? Yeah, well, again, you're flying all over the place. Um, and I'm saying, are we being selective then in what data we're choosing to use to, uh, as, to support our narrative here? I suggest you're lost in data or the, the absence of it. It's staring you in the face. It is not staring me in the face. In not, fact, even the, the director of planning Hardwick, acknowledged that they Councilor didn't Hardwick, happen. Councillor Hardwick, this is a I question just, period. Sorry, it's I not just a debate. Heard Michael say, uh, you know, make a bunch of claims about my father, and I'm not allowed to talk about. You're that. actually not. This is questions to a speaker. So it's I not asked a about data. He told me to follow the data, and then said we were lost in data. We're so, lost um, searching for it. The data well, is there. I mean, look, look at the, look at the evidence. The po we have a million. What no? What's the what's the new population moving to Canada? A million people over the next four years. A third of them will come here. We, we need new housing. We cannot just wander around asking for data. It's when it's stand. It's literally staring us in the face. Wander around. Anyhow, I it, there's no point in pursuing this conversation. I I'll leave it. Councillor Dominato, up to five minutes. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Hi, Michael. Thanks for coming in. Welcome. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. I, I asked it to staff earlier. You may have heard the answer. I was asking about um, uh, four-story uh, rentals, fourplex townhomes, stock townhomes on uh, local streets. And, and I think staff response was that probably the most financially viable form was the four-story apartment style. Um, and I was asking more in the context of stacked townhomes or row homes. And I'm just curious if you could comment on that from, from your perspective, because um, uh, yeah. it's something I'm interested in. And I think that uh, many families are interested in seeing as well. Yeah, I mean, the challenge really is the area and the expense of new construction. Um, it, frankly, the land cost as well. Um, it's difficult. A townhome consumes a lot of space. And so I think we have to look at compact designs. If you want affordable rental affordability, one of the policies you can do is, is to relax some of the design guidelines to create more compact, but still livable units. You can have um, uh, units with, with um, shared light, borrowed light, internal bedrooms, you know, one out of three. Um, but townhomes consume a lot of space and the rents needed to balance the books are really high. So developers, I think, are are uh, reluctant to, to build rental townhomes. Um, but you know you will find them in different parts of the region, particularly in suburban locations. But um, in Vancouver, with its land costs, uh, I think it's just the, just the price points on the rents are gonna be challenging. Thanks, I appreciate that. Oh, you're Thanks for coming this evening. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Swanson, up to five. Yeah, hi, Michael. Hello, Councillor Swanson. You I think you showed me my first pro forma. I did. I don't know if you remember. A more, long than time a, ago. more than a decade ago. 20, yeah. you know, 15 years ago, I think. So you seem to be pretty smart about housing. Try. So we have stats that say that um, the median renter household, household income is about 50K. How do we get housing that those folks can afford? Yeah, well, I think staff in the proportion that's necessary. Yeah, I think I think in your staff reports, they've, they've got the spectrum of housing and a spectrum of supply that includes government and includes uh, developers who do mixed mixed market below market projects. Um, uh, the minimum wage in, in BC just went up to 15 20 an hour. And we're hearing today, of course, the, the, the living wage is now $20 an hour. So acknowledging that there's there are these gaps, but two people earning minimum wage ha have a combined income gross a year of $66,000. So we're, get, we're getting there, you know, in terms of minimum wage work and the ability to house people. We have an income problem as well as a housing problem. Um, I think that's pretty clear. You know, Vancouver's always struggled. What we're seeing new jobs come to Vancouver, better paying jobs, tech jobs. 
Um, but I, to, to answer your question, I think we really need to partner with, um, with BC Housing and CMHC and to keep the money flowing into British Columbia and into Vancouver. And I think council, you have to be nimble and create the policy environment that allows de nonprofit developers to get on with their projects quickly. You don't need, I mean, literally a year of rezoning at minimum for these, you know, for, for a project that's outside of existing policy. That's, that's, you, that's, that's harmful. Do you think if this goes through that it will result in any non-market housing? Non-market, below market. Yeah, oh, you know, it'll create. It'll non-market, create... yeah, non-market. What do you mean? Oh, like owned by uh, owned by third party uh, um, nonprofits? Owned by government or a nonprofit association? And uh, government is entirely please. yeah. A government's entirely free to play in this space as well too. Why not? Because they can't afford the land. They can afford the land. <laughs> you just need a capital. Like how do they afford the the building? You know, they get they, they put a capital contribution in. If you want to do, do rent, you think that? Yeah. Do you think that? Uh, that the private sector will build any below market in this um, with this plan? Absolutely. If you do, a, if you have the option of doing a six-story building and and the the economics work out, um, the the idea of having the uh, the twenty percent below market that that can work. But again, it's really marginal, and you have to you have to be very careful about the the costs. It can happen, and there's and there's provision in the zoning for that, or the proposed Did zoning. You, do you want to hazard a guess as to what the percentage of below market would be? I can't, no. But the option okay. is there. The Thank option is there. I guess the question is, if you want to flip it, is to say, what's the incentive? And, and is, it, is it economically sound? Have you, worked out the, have you worked out the numbers so that it's appealing for someone to do this, you know, at the end of the day? Does it make sense? Can they actually finance it? Can the, will a bank um, finance their project? You have to be a partner de-risking a market developer if you want them to deliver you below market housing. But it can be done. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Kirby on? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mayor. I, I just have one question, Michael, and it's, it's uh, I think, trying to get to the heart of it. Council's going to have three options on this um, by the time we finish hearing speakers vote for it, vote against it, or conceptually, there could be amendments to try to further gate to pick up on this or to refer to Vancouver plan, for example, in your opinion, what signal and what are the outcome of those three choices? What's the impact of those three outcomes? Approve it. Please, no amendments to the amended amendments. We've had enough. I'm not, I think, I'm I not, no, and th let me be clear. I'm not yeah. suggesting them. I'm just saying that these are hypothetically as a body. I yeah. think that can, might entertain. And I'm asking what you think yeah. Approve in it. terms of housing impact. The, what, what is the impact of a yes decision? What is the impact of a no decision? What is the impact yeah. of a change it and mash it all up decision? Uh, putting it off for a no decision is going to send a lot of really good investors away. They're not going to come to Vancouver. They're going to invest their money building housing in some other community, and we'll be we'll be poorer for it. So approve it. It's it's overdue. It's overdue. There are people waiting for this. There are people patiently waiting for this. I don't think it's I don't think it will help anyone, any citizen of Vancouver, if you delay this or or you or refuse it. It'll be harmful. And the choice, you have this, this, this decision-making power right now. Um, and I, I would commend you to approve it. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Thanks for that. Thanks. Thanks. That's it for questions. Really appreciate you coming in uh, today. Thank you. And speaking to us. Thanks. And we're going to move uh, to our next speaker. I know that uh, the speaker's in person, so it might take a second to set up the podium. Uh, but it's uh, Michael Brown, speaker number four of... 72. And uh, clerks, if you can let me know when the speaker's ready.
Uh, Mayor Sp Stewart, uh, Speaker 4 is ready to go. Great. Okay. Hi, Speaker. Uh, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Excellent. Uh, I'll just start by saying my name is Michael Brown. I am a Vancouver resident, and I am speaking in support of the report recommendations. I will confess I have developed a number of C2 projects throughout the uh, area of Vancouver and have some in the works at the moment, but I am actually here speaking on behalf of my two daughters that will want to live and thrive in Vancouver in the long term, and I truly believe that this initiative will move us forward in making Vancouver a, a better place in the long run. So I support the streaming rental around local shopping area initiatives because the city is in a housing crisis and our existing rental stock is aging and is in very short supply. I firmly believe the initiative will result in a meaningful increase in the new purpose-built rental housing being constructed, which in my opinion is one of the most important steps in alleviating the current housing crisis. Increasing opportunities for the rental housing is of utmost importance because rental housing will provide options for households who cannot or choose not to pursue home ownership, which in turn creates more complete and inclusive neighborhoods by better meeting the diverse needs of a range of household incomes of the people who want to live and work in Vancouver. The addition of the increased rental housing specifically around the local shopping areas will help make these shopping areas more vibrant and economically sustainable by having more people in and around neighborhoods in order to support them. And it will also allow the residents who live there to be less reliant on cars and reduce their overall carbon emissions. Lastly, I'd like to express my support for the increased environmental standards being proposed, which will help the city fight the climate change emergency by ensuring these new buildings are built to very high environmental standards to minimize carbon emissions. In conclusion, the streaming rental around local shopping area initiative is an excellent policy that will move the city forward in a very positive direction. Increasing the options for purpose-built rental housing around shopping areas is a win for the future residents who live in these homes, the businesses surrounding them, and Vancouver as a whole, as it will help create a more complete neighborhood that support a diverse range of housing needs and incomes. Thank you for your time and thoughtful consideration of this very beneficial housing policy. Thank you so much. I have a question from Councillor Carr. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming in. Um, so what is it in the terms of the staff report recommendations that incentivize, that would incentivize more building of rental housing in your mind? In, in my opinion, I look at this and I go, particularly in the C2 areas, it is, it, it gives this rental housing as an actual option, not having to go through the rezoning is a very important um, part of that in the C2, but it is a very, very marginal decision. I am currently working on a project that is looking at it, A or B, and it is a, a thin margin under which it's being done. So if it was layered with any more affordability requirement, particularly in that C2 area, I do believe that you will not get rental building um, coming to that C2. So I think the big thing that's incentivizing this now is the, the ability to do it without a, without a rezoning. And I assume that saves time and money. Significant time and money. Okay. okay, thank you. And put some certainty on it, not putting it through a big public process. Right, that's right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That's it for questions. Appreciate you coming in tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. We'll move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Megan uh, Pohanka. Thank you, and good evening. Can everyone hear me? We can, up to five minutes, whenever you're ready. Great. My name is Megan Pohanka. I'm a resident of Vancouver, and I'm the Vice President of Project Generation at Catalyst Community Development Society. Catalyst is in support of these proposed policy changes. For those who may not be familiar with Catalyst or our work, I'd like just to take a minute to explain our model. We are a Vancouver-based nonprofit society incorporated in 2013 with a mission to deliver affordable housing and program space in our community. We bring market real estate development expertise and financial, e financial equity 
to work with nonprofits and faith-based organizations to support the development of their assets for community benefit. Catalyst also acquires real estate, which we develop, own, and operate to provide below market rental housing. We have completed seven projects to date, five of which we own or co-own and operate. We currently have 10 projects in development across BC, totaling 1,400 secured non-market residential units and 80,000 square feet of community and commercial space. Catalyst is focused on serving tenants with household incomes in the range of approximately 30,000 to 100,000 per year, representing the dem demographic who stands to benefit from this new proposed policy. These policy changes would open the door for existing underutilized land in our city in transit oriented and walkable neighborhoods to be redeveloped through a more predictable and streamlined process. This provides a more even playing field through incentivizing landowners and developers to pursue rental over more condo development. Eliminating the requirement for a rezoning further incentivizes more projects to be brought forward, saving significant time and money and expediting the delivery of more homes in our communities. As a nonprofit who partners with other nonprofits and charities, it is very challenging to make the project financials work. Other elements of this policy are aligned with supporting our ability to create viable projects, including the six story building form, allowing for light wood frame construction, which is significantly more cost effective for our project over conventional concrete construction. This allows us to maximize the number of homes and revenue generating area provided in our projects. The new policy will also require new rental projects to achieve more advanced energy performance targets in the form of passive house certification or net zero emissions. The support in this policy of a simplified building form allows for stacking of floor plates and other design efficiencies, especially relative to energy performance. Reducing building stepping and the requirement for more complex exterior forms aligns with passive design principles and optimal building system design. In closing, our team is in very much support of these encouraging policy changes that will increase the supply of desperately needed rental housing secured in perpetuity. We at Catalyst look forward to the prospect of partnering with groups in these zones that could now explore the opportunity to steward their land through the inclusion of rental housing, which is vital for the long-term success and livability of our city. Thank you. Thank you. You do have a question. Uh, Councillor Swanson for up to five minutes. Yeah, thanks for coming. So the CCPA had a study that said that if land were free, uh, nonprofits could build housing that um, say where a one bedroom would rent for 1300 and that could be finagled around with, so some could pay 800 and some could pay 1800. Is that kind of what Catalyst does, that kind of thing? We, our projects are kind of across the spectrum. It depends on the municipality and, and the specific terms of that redevelopment, as well as what our partners strive to achieve. So our projects are mixed income. So there's a range um, of, of what we can support within the building and the higher rent in, in that particular redevelopment will support deeper subsidies of other units. And to your point on, on land, um, much of our, our work is dependent on the land being provided usually through um, a partner in like a church or other faith-based organization that has very valuable land in the city, but not any additional equity. And that's where we'll come to the table and work together to, to mutually move our mission forward. So do you think that Catalyst could take advantage of this proposal and build non-market housing that would serve people in the 30 to 80 K income range? Definitely, we we see a lot of possibility uh, should this policy be approved. Uh, echoing but you, your comments, there's, oh, sorry, go ahead. But you'd have to get someone to buy the land for you. Yes, we're, we, it's, it's a long road to get to a point where um, we as a nonprofit could support um, significant injections to purchase land. But to date, we've had a lot of success in partnering uh, with municipalities as well 
where the land is donated as an equity injection into the project to make it viable. So if the city did a land assembly, for example, on a just off an arterial or something, they might partner with you to build some housing that actually was affordable? Yes, that process has been done before through an RFP um, to deliver exactly that using existing city land and uh, redeveloping for affordable housing use. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, and that's it for questions. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next speaker. Appreciate you coming in tonight. Uh, we thank have you. Craig, uh, thank you. Uh, Craig Jorgensen, speaker number six. Thank you, council. Thank you, Council. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Craig Jorgensen. I live and work in Vancouver. I'm humbled to join you tonight as we gather virtually and in person to discuss land, the land use vision of the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, which form our city. I take a moment before my comments on this matter before Council today to center the fact that the millennial-old housing typology of our city is multifamily longhouses. Our city and community carry the sins of burning down these at the Senoc, uh village and continue to hold the majority of that land in the form of Vanier Park uh, to this uh, proposal today. There are elements of the proposal that I support, support without reservation, but I have specific areas of the proposal which seem to contradict other aspects of the proposal, previous council direction regarding the citywide plan and the climate emergency action plan. I have four key amendments I urge you to make to this item in order to make this a wonderful uh, plan that will enable Vancouver to restore its traditional character. These amendments would serve to deprioritize rentals in hazardous locations and prioritize them in livable transit-oriented areas. First, amend the eligibility map to actually include rapid transit stops and stations as a criteria. This is stated in the policy statements, but the eligibility map excludes the entire Nanaimo and 29th app station areas and portions of the Renfrew and Rupert stations, as well as the R4 stops. Um, second, remove portions of the truck intensive arterial corridors, such as Knight Clark, to phase out the practice of sacrificing renters' health as living shields to protect low density neighborhoods from noise and poor air quality. Third, prioritize implementation of the four story zones first and then later permit the six story districts. This will allow communities to step up to high density rather than having density that is belatedly steps down to low density. Fourth, direct staff to provide an update to Council and the public on the status of the Nanaimo, 29th Ave, Renfrew, and Rupert Station area plans, which has been directed as, as quick actions in the Vancouver plan, but are now completely missing from any of the current planning conversations. Thank you for your time, and I'm available for any questions. Thanks for coming in. I don't see any um, questions for you, so I'm gonna move on to the next speaker, but thanks so much for uh, sharing your thoughts. Uh, Council, we're going to hear from uh, Re uh, Roberta uh, Olenek, <laughs> Olenek uh, speaker number seven. Can you hear me? Sure can. Please go ahead up to uh, five minutes. Okay. My name is Roberta Olenek. I live in Vancouver, and I strongly oppose this secured rental policy. First, the inclusion in one public hearing of both the amendments to C2 zones and the creation of the new rental zones in low density areas is inappropriate. These two aspects are completely different beasts. They have been rightly treated separately in many previous engagement processes. To conflate them now at this critical stage creates confusion and makes it harder for people to comment. Council must therefore carefully discern whether comments provided in this hearing refer to only one or the other aspect or to the plan as a whole. And I wonder whether it's possible for council to approve one aspect and not the other, or if this is an all or nothing proposition. My comments today concern the new rental zones in low density areas. I support facilitating more rental in housing in these areas, but doing so through the new rental zones is unacceptable for reasons too numerous to cover in five minutes. Among these reasons, the notification and engagement processes used to obtain public input were inherently biased in favor of the policy. The new rental zones would be imposed even though all data on actual housing needs 
has yet to be provided as required by the motion recalibrating the Housing Vancouver strategy post-COVID. Rezoning for market rental would increase land values, making housing less affordable, not more. Imposing these rental zones uniformly across vast swaths of the city ignores existing community plans and the unique context of Vancouver's diverse neighborhoods. Building multi-story apartment buildings that take up virtually the entire lot right next to much smaller existing houses would significantly impact livability for current residents. Alarmingly, the referral report makes repeated reference to extending the new rental zones to additional streets beyond those currently included without any indication that the public will ever be consulted about those extensions. In that case, what is to stop the city from making every street a rental zone, leaving nowhere to live for those who want to avoid having an apartment block as their next door neighbor? The referral report admits that quote, introducing larger buildings would have some impact on existing homes in low density areas, particularly on immediately neighboring lots, end quote. Let's be clear, these impacts would not be on existing homes, they would be on the people living in those homes. The report describes these impacts as incremental. For me, they would be monumental. My house is not an investment, it's my home my refuge, sanctuary, my nest. Over 25, 29 years, I have put much time and effort into renovating to make it my own. In my little yard, all the retaining walls and walkways are built from carefully collected reclaimed materials. I have put in a native plant garden and a small pond to create habitat for my beloved birds and pollinators. I am fed by my fruit trees, berry bushes, vegetables, and herbs. I share my produce with friends and neighbors. If a multi-story building were built next to me, looming over my treasured now sunny garden, my, house would be, my home would become just a house, and for me, an unlivable house. To be compelled to move from a place I wanted to stay until I was too old to manage is a daunting and exhausting prospect. Wherever I moved in my remaining lifetime, there would not be enough time to recreate my garden. At 65, I really don't have the energy to start all over again. Until this rental plan, I never imagined I might have to. There are better ways to integrate rental housing into low-density neighborhoods. Why not apply the new rental zones to specific city blocks where all the current residents agree to them? Why not replace the boxy buildings allowed under the rental policy with duplexes, laneway houses, and row houses of a height, placement, and footprint that more closely align with existing homes and garages? Why not provide incentives for converting existing homes into three, street, into three suites through the secondary suite program for rentals? These solutions would respect the concerns of current residents and thus ensure new renters would be welcomed to the neighborhood. Thank you, speaker, is that it? Yes. Thanks so much. Uh, there are no questions for you, so I am going to thank you for participating today and we're gonna move on to the next speaker. Uh, thanks again. We have uh, Jeremy Stone, speaker number uh, eight. All right, uh, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Jeremy Stone. I live here in Vancouver and until recently I lived at Oak and 22nd. <clears throat> and I just want to assure you that living on Ontario sucks. Um, there's constant noise pollution, cars, trucks, ambulances, all hours of the day and into the night. Uh, there's air pollution, as the Sightline study ha has described, you know, 50, uh, you know, two and a half years are taken off of your life if you live within 50 meters of an arterial. And, and I know that that's an average, but I really worry about what I've done to my daughter by living on an arterial for three years. Uh, there's no grass or yards. Uh, there's nowhere I can have a barbecue with friends. I, I can't sit in the grass with my daughter and read a book. Um, also, in Vancouver, there are few meaningful trees being planted on arterials. If you've been to the concrete hellscape of Maine between 8th and Terminal, you'll see that uh, many of the trees are just small, spindly, sickly things. And there's no, you know, actual tree cover. There's nothing visually appealing with the trees. Uh, there's no shade. 
Um, another thing to mention is that living on arterials is actually expensive. Uh, beyond the bizarre definition of affordable that Vancouver uses, which is completely decoupled from median income, if you look at Craigslist, the majority of two bedrooms on Broadway are $3,000 or more. And on Canby, south of King Ed, they can range up to 5000 or more. And these are often for units that are 500 to 600 square feet in size. Uh, Patrick Condon made a good point that speculation has already begun to drive up prices, and it is very likely that these units won't even be fake Vancouver affordable by the time they're built, much less actually affordable. So the reason I'm against this plan is the council is not taking the distribution of density throughout the city seriously. Density needs to be channeled into single-family neighborhoods and not simply arterials. It's endlessly frustrating that this council can't even pass a moderate proposal to pilot 100 units of multifamily density in scatter sites around the city, but staff can somehow pull together a plan to force even more density into already dense arterials. If any of you have read any planning literature, you'll know that there are dozens and dozens of articles about the huge negative contributions that single family housing has on the climate crisis, the loss of complete communities, housing affordability, and similar issues. Cities are suffering due to single-family housing. There's little empirical question here regarding that statement. But this council is just chipping away at the edges of the problem, forcing density into arterials and pushing basement suites instead of getting real about the vast swaths of underutilized land in the city that is occupied by single-family zone neighborhoods. I didn't agree with Gregor Robertson on much, but when he was asked about the enormous increases of density in the West End and Grandview Woodlands local area plans, he responded by saying something along the lines of, we are expecting huge population increases in Vancouver over the next few decades, and everybody is going to have to share in the density. But I'm getting the feeling that those of us who are shoved into arterial housing are the only ones sharing in the density. Single-family homeowners get to enjoy all the benefits of lower densities, quiet streets, tree cover, and other amenities, while single parents like me are stuck in arterials and expensive units and all the negative impacts that they carry. So instead of cramming more density in arterials, I would love for this council to stand up to single-family homeowners and craft zoning plans that force them to share in the density, real density, multi-unit density that can house our whole population and share the benefits of non-arterial streets. Until council can make significant strides towards reforming single-family zoning in the city, there's just no way I could support additional density on arterials. This needs to go back to staff and a more comprehensive plan needs to be developed. And uh, just two final points, you know, in situations like these, we're always presented with the argument that, well, this is just one of the tools in the toolbox. This is the opportunity we have at hand, so it's better to do something nothing. But we never seem to get to the more foundational proposals. We just get these piecemeal bits at the edges, and it's just not good enough anymore. We need transformational change now. And finally, I'd like to mention that I've read the other public comments against this rezoning, and I do not stand with them at all, specifically the nimbious ones decrying how density will destroy their neighborhood. That's all a crock, and I have no desire to be lumped in with them. So that's it. Thanks. Sorry about the rant. That's fine. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I don't see any uh, questions for you, so we'll move on to right. the uh, next speaker. Thanks, though, for participating tonight. and. Yep. We are on to Melissa Lim. Uh, sorry, Melissa Melissa Lim, speaker number nine. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I appreciate this opportunity to speak tonight. Um, as mentioned, my name is Melissa Lem, and I'm a family doctor who lives and works in Vancouver. And I'm also president-elect of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. And tonight, I'm asking you to support the streamlining rental around local shopping areas proposal because I feel it provides a balanced look at what we need to do to increase rentals and housing in the city. So I live in Kitsilano with my family in a home near a major arterial street in an area directly affected by the proposed changes. And if new rental buildings are built near us as a result of this proposal passing, we will see more people on our quiet sidewalks, construction sites at our windows and folder buses. And you know what? I'm really hoping that happens. One major reason I feel this way is because this proposal is a great move for the climate, which is on many of our minds as the world converges on Glasgow this week for COP26. And our job is to take these commitments our governments are making to the world and implement them here at home. Increasing density near local shopping areas and transit corridors means more people walking and rolling to meet their daily needs instead of burning fossil fuels that pollute the air, killing over 15,000 Canadians each year. Not only that, 
but choosing active transportation like walking or cycling also boosts our mood and cardiovascular health, saving money and connecting us to our communities. And there's also a good chance, and I hope that these new multifamily homes will be built with clean all-electric heating, using heat pumps that can warm homes in the winter, cool homes in the summer, and save lives, instead of using dirty fracked natural gas from northern BC that harms local and global health, contributing to the almost 600 deaths we saw from BC's extreme heat this summer. Housing is one of the most important social determinants of health, and we know we have a housing crisis in our city. An increasing proportion of people are renting because of affordability issues, which can result in housing insecurity when landlords sell or renovate. Having to move multiple times is linked to depression, low self-esteem, lack of attachment to your community, and worse physical health and chronic diseases in children persisting into adulthood. As we know, over half of people in our city are renters, and it's so important that they have access to more affordable, purpose-built rental housing to avoid being evicted and those health consequences. Two decades of research also show that higher urban density, when well-planned, is linked to a lower risk of diseases like diabetes, heart disease, and obesity because of increased physical activity. This will help us adapt to the global heating we know is going to get worse before it gets better because climate change amplifies existing health risks. So outside my window right now, I know there are trees that are changing color and huge evergreens across the street. And I'm thinking about the run I took by the ocean this morning and our family's walk to the grocery store last week to buy treats for Halloween. Other families with diverse incomes also deserve the chance to live in secure and affordable housing right here in my neighborhood too. So I encourage you tonight to please take a look at the big picture and vote to support these important housing changes that will take us faster down the pathway to cleaner air, increased active transportation, and climate-friendlier communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you do have questions, Councillor Carr. You're up for five minutes. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lam, for um, coming to speak to us. Um, I don't know if you listened to the speaker just before you, um, but he uh, was a resident who lived with his family on an arterial, and he um, relayed to us his concerns about, um, about living on arterials in terms of uh, the noise, the air pollution, possible impacts of those on his daughter. Um, what are your comments about that? Yeah, and I definitely hear um, those concerns, and we do know that air pollution is linked to increased risk of heart disease, lung disease, cancer, developmental issues in children. Um, so in, I would say I do agree that more areas of the city should be opened up to development um, for rental housing, but I think one thing we have to keep in mind also is kind of the overall climate uh, our overall climate plans, right? So if you open up, for example, um, areas for higher density housing in, in areas that aren't well supplied by public transit, um, don't have lots of amenities nearby, then people will be driving more and they won't necessarily be taking public transit as much. So, you know, I think it's a trade-off in some ways between having access to amenities um, and public transit where you can easily walk and roll um, and and kind of the, you know, the aims of overall increase in rentals and, and uh, air quality. Yeah, anyway, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough question, but overall I would say, you know, the city could go further in expanding rentals past just arterials and, and the block beside them. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe we all can go faster um, in, in the industrial sector and getting uh, non-polluting uh, hybrid and, and uh, electric vehicles too. <laughs> Okay, thank, yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate your, your uh, taking the time to speak to us. Thanks. Uh, I have questions for you, uh, Doctor. Thank you very much for, for calling in uh, this evening and, and your uh, repeat performances. Uh, really appreciate your input in, in uh, our debates here. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, you might have missed it earlier today, but uh, in council questions to staff, we asked uh, this, uh, this um, this report is tied to Big Move One in our Climate Emergency Action Plan, and it's the first substantive um, motion we have forward to Council in terms of building complete communities. Um, what do you think, um, I, I just asked you what, what you think about, about that, how important is this, and how are you feeling our, our Council's doing in terms of addressing uh, the climate emergency? Mayor Stewart, I think, that is an incredibly important question, especially as we've just come off a summer where we saw close to 595 deaths from extreme heat from the heat dome, 
I saw more patients in my office than I ever have in my entire career with heat illness. And then also, you know, that uh, as we know, Lytton, which burned to the ground because of direct effects from the climate emergency and, and burning fossil fuels. So I think city staff have made, have made it pretty clear that every single one of these measures is absolutely important for us to hit our goals um, of, you know, a 50% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030 and net zero by 2050. So it's absolutely important that every single one of these measures passes. And, you know, I, I called in and, and spoke about the climate emergency parking program um, last time in support, in support of that. And I do believe that that was very important to pass. But given that it didn't, I think it's even more important that every single measure that we put forth that's going to result in reduced emissions like this big move one, like, like this plan, it's, it's even more important that it passes now. Thanks so much. And you, did I catch that you actually live on an arterial yourself or on a main road? Yeah, I live, um, I live about two blocks in from a major arterial. Okay. And part of this uh, proposal is to both uh, allow rental on um, arterials and, and just one street in from arterials, so similar to where you're living. Um, just, um, uh, I guess I'm just thinking about... Um, well, I think I've lost my train of thought after chairing for 12 hours and I've forgotten okay, my, <laughs> my question. <laughs> but just uh, wanted to thank you for uh, calling in this evening. And, uh, and uh, um, oh, actually, my question was, how do you imagine our arterials will look in a decade or, or 20 years? Do you know what I've noticed as I walk in my neighborhood that there are a lot of empty businesses? Um, and I think part of it is that not a lot of people can afford to live in these neighborhoods, right? And I know in the neighborhood just beside mine, Point Grey, there's, it's emptying out of, of retail in many places because there aren't just the volumes of people um, to, to, frequent those, uh, to, to frequent those amenities. So I can imagine, you know, if I, if I think about the major arterial that I live close to, I can see more families walking. I, I see bustling cafes. I see, you know, tree-lined streets where people are enjoying walking and, and rolling. Um, I think it will just result in a more vibrant neighborhood where people are connected to their communities, where they have secure housing, where they can actually build connections to those communities. So, yeah, that's, that's what I hope for. That's what I hope to see in my own community. And what do you think about vehicular traffic? Do you think we're going to make some inroads and replace more and more cars with electric vehicles and more vehicles overall with, with public transit? I mean, do you kind of see that as the direction Vancouver is generally going? I, I absolutely hope so. Yep. Um, yes. I mean, again, you know, a lot of funding, for, some funding for that would have come from passage of the climate emergency parking program. But um, overall, it seems like we are oriented in that direction. And certainly the mandates that the federal and provincial governments have brought in about um, zero emissions vehicles and kind of, in, you know, incentivizing public transit, hopefully we'll go a long way towards that as well. Mm. So I guess uh, today's, uh, you know, emissions choked arterials could actually turn into 10 or 15 years to a, actually a, a much different place in the city. That's uh, right. Without, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The cars that are on them, hopefully will be cleaner. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much for your time this evening. That's it for questions for you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, Council, we are at uh, 9.48. We probably have time for one more uh, speaker, and we've got uh, uh, Timon Stewart in person. Speaker number 10. Well, hello. Hi there. I, I kind of want to come at this in a different way. I mean, you already know what I'm kind of up to as it is, but I've, I'm, I'm genuinely speaking from a, a, a personal feeling of I'm just sick to my stomach at what's going on. And I've changed everything I want to say because I listen to people and I'm, I'm listening to the fact that the majority of people speaking tonight are developers, which is exactly what I'm angry at, is the fact that it feels like the city leans towards constant development, and I'm not against that. I live on an arterial too. I live on West 12th Avenue, and I'm happy to have density increases. I want to have more around me as well. But at the same time, I don't want a six-story apartment building built beside me. I'm not selling my home. My home is my life. 
I've had this home for 22 years. I took out every ounce of savings I had and my, my RRSPs, and I bought this home, and I rented out my basement until I progressed enough in my job that I could afford my own mortgage. I've talked to so many people. This isn't about rich and poor. This isn't about just arbitrarily throwing the fact that we're going to do the same thing in every part of the city. This isn't right. What makes sense is to talk to the communities themselves, each community, and let's find the ways that we can increase the density, increase rentals, and still maintain our historic nature in the city and not clear cut everything to put up a six story or a four story apartment building. It's horrific. Mr. Weeb asked, or Councillor Weeb asked a really good question of Mr. Erb, and Mr. Erb's answer was, well, you know, that would require neighborhood specific planning and this would be too cumbersome. That's the whole point here. It should be cumbersome. We should be talking to our communities, each individual, whether you live in Kitts, whether you live on the west side, whether you live off of King Edward, it doesn't matter. Talk to these communities, talk to these people, and say, hey, how do we make the neighborhood stay as a neighborhood and still in, open up things so that people can live there and we have more communities and we have more density and rentals? Everybody seems to think that adding more rentals is going to solve everything. Let's be realistic. Nobody who's really following what's going on out here thinks these are going to be affordable rentals. You're going to drive out my family and thousands of other families into what? Rentals? Where would you like people to go? We're human beings, and everyone talks about units and land values and houses. It's not about that. These are homes. This is everyone's home. If someone's apartment building was being torn down for another apartment building, my heart would go out to that situation. I would go, oh my God, this is wrong. These people are being forced out of their homes. This is the problem. Let's work together, all sides. Let's find the answers and not make swathing choices of building all the height and width we possibly can build in one fell swoop everywhere. That isn't the answer. I'm, I'm just, I've been so sick and feeling so knotted at not being able to have choices and, and participate and feel what's going on. You, you say everybody knows. I had somebody I work with practically daily call me the yesterday and say, I saw you on the front of the newspaper. And I thought, what's going on? And then I looked at the site for the city and it was like, oh my God, I'm on the blue zone. My entire neighborhood is slated for rezoning and the single family homes are coming down. They didn't even know. And this is just one example. I have dozens of examples, you can well imagine. There are thousands of people who have no concept of what's happening here. And this is part of why I went, there's gotta be a way to deal with this. There's gotta be something that says, I can do so something else. I'm gonna hire a lawyer. So this is what I'm doing. I see I have two seconds left. We're actually over time, thanks very much, but you do have uh, questions for Councillor Hardwick. And just a reminder, Council, we uh, have about seven minutes left in, in this hearing, so uh, Councillor Hardwick. Well, thank you, Timon, and thank you for your passion for your home and your neighborhood. But after having said that, why don't you just sell and move? Open it up. Well, people I, that want to develop it, why don't you just sell and move? That's a really good point. And, you know, Michael Mortensen, when he left, asked me the same question when I said to him, I think you're being unrealistic about your development ideas. It, not everyone has that luxury. I'm not a rich person. I'm, I've done well in my life. I have. I've been able to afford my home. But through many circumstances with dozens of people I talk to, I'm... I'm carrying a million and a half dollar mortgage on the house I have now. 
so I'll get an extra 500,000 if I sell, and where am I going to go? I guess I can go rent. I can take my five family household and I can go rent. So that's why I can't sell. And then if I don't sell, I've invested in my home. I literally have spent 22 years in my home and put my heart and soul into it. Everything I've done in that home, I've done myself. I have a 200 foot beech tree on my front lawn that is the size of this podium in front of me wide. And wants to be torn down, or it's going to get torn down to make room for something else. That's not right. I can't sell, and then I won't be able to afford. This is all about affordability. This is literally what it boils down to. Everyone's talking about affordability, except the developers. It's about affordability. This city isn't affordable. I get it. I, I can't move. Even if I wanted to, I can't move. But like many people in so many of these neighborhoods, we've invested in our homes, and it's our livelihood. So I, I can't sell. I just can't. Thank you. Again, thank you for um, your passion on the subject. Very much appreciate you speaking to us today. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young? Yeah, hi. Thanks for being here. I just had a couple of quick follow-up questions. You mentioned um, sort of having a, a multi-story building next to you, and you're on West 12th Avenue. So are you in a Single family homes, do you have just single family homes around you? I'm just trying to get a yes, bit of context. Yes, I, I have single family homes around me. Yes. Okay, so you yeah. don't have anything. I have, a, I have, the, smaller... school, I have the school right, uh, Kids High right across the street from me, which doesn't bother me. The arterial doesn't bother me. I know there was a huge rant by a gentleman saying, hey, arterials are horrific and polluting and everything else. I, I, I've always enjoyed living where I live. I really have. It's, it's, I okay. love my neighborhood. And you do have, because I'm very familiar with that area, I used to live there, because you do have multi-story to the west of you, um, at west of Vine, do you not? Uh, to the east of us, there is multi-story. Up, up, yes, I'm off to the Sorry, east of Vine. Of yes, not yeah. west, to the east of Vine. Okay. If yeah. my neighbors how, wanted how to how, sell... How, how is that working in the neighborhood? Because that's fairly close, like that's within a yeah, block or two. It's, it's, right? it's been there for so long you don't notice it. But I'm sure, you know, I have no clue how long those, they, they've certainly been there for the 22 years I've been there. So let's say 30 years ago when they redeveloped that, I'm sure there was a, an uproar even then. But I, I think we can still do the density. It, like, if I have three neighbors beside me who want to sell, and we say to them, hey, sh they go ahead and sell to a developer, and the developer wants to develop in a historic way that suits the neighborhood, doesn't make it six stories high, makes it a two-story building, I know, and then creates the same green space and then plots nine so, apartments so that on that area, be, then you've yeah, got triple wanted, the density is from the three homes yeah, to the nine homes. I just homes. wanted to jump in because we get a very limited amount of time that we're allowed to ask questions. And Sorry. so that was going to be my question in terms of how you would see the density happening. Do you just see it being lower, like you said, for, for example, two stories? Like, I'm just trying to get a sense of yeah, what that's, that's, that's how I would see it respecting the neighborhoods. And that's why my, 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 I challenge you to find ways to do it per neighborhood. There, okay. But like that four story, for example, on Vine and 12 that you said sort of blends in, it's been there a long time. That's not something like that, that you would support. I, no, would I would not. No, I would not. I would, I would support more townhomes or more variable ways to build so that, that we're, we're clear cutting. We're clear cutting homes and we're clear cutting trees and we're, we're ignoring our environment. I mean, everybody keeps talking about environment. So, and yet we're not talking about the fact that we're to destroy the entire tree canopy when 70% of the city is covered. The trees are owned by private citizens. Like 70% of the tree canopy is, set, is, is owned by privates. And we're going to redevelop all that. That's, that's okay, a, so, that's your, so your, your perspective two stories is reasonable in terms of densification, is, is that? Sorry, um, is I, that I, right? sorry right. I didn't understand. Sorry, I just going to jump here. Uh, Mayor, Councilor can you make a motion to finish hearing from the speaker in line of questions? Uh, actually, we're at 9.59, and if we don't extend, uh, we it's will. Final. I'll make a motion to extend. to extend. And we need two-thirds vote on that. Do we have a seconder for that? Second. Second. Councilor Dominato. Okay, all in favor of extending to hear the speaker, uh, say yay. 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 Those opposed say nay. Thank you. Please continue, Councillor Kirby. Thank you. 
Yeah, sorry. So I just wanted to be clear. So, you know, in terms of, you said you supported densification, you want to respect sort of the, the, the sort of the existing residents in the neighborhood. And so you're suggesting that two stories is the most appropriate way to do that. Do you see any other options beyond that? Again, it, it's kind of how I started is, is we need to focus on what each neighborhood will, will, will needs and can be part of and, and go to each neighborhood and actually inform them of what the choice, what we can do and how do we work together, both the neighbors, the communities, the city, staff, mm -hmm. and a developer together. Now, the problem is, of course, developers want money. That, that's all that's going on here is these these are the okay. people that are going to win the developers no, i'm just going to leave it there because i was just okay. interested not in sort of like consultation but your specific because you're speaking to your experiences i was trying to get your your specific perspective but thank you for speaking to council i appreciate it well, thanks for asking thanks much and there are no other questions for you so i'll just thank you for your time and council just inform you that we're going to recess the meeting now uh and pick it up um with speaker number 11 i believe of 70 uh, on uh, Thursday night at 6 p.m. I think that's right, Clerk. Is that, uh, I think I've got that all. Uh, yes, 6 p.m. on Thursday. Great. Thanks so much, Council. So uh, appreciate your time today, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. Good night.